2021, the year things got... better? I think it's safe to say this was a transitional year, and for many of us, we coped by doing a lot of streaming. Was Disney a big part of that streaming? You bet it was. But another big part of streaming is also gaming. Yeah, every year for Disney Simber, I always try to think of some sort of new interesting element to add to the mix, and like a lot of you, I played a lot of games growing up, and because Disney owns, what, one-third of the planet now, obviously there's gonna be some Disney games in there too. But didn't just have to be old nostalgic games that I played growing up, it could be current... dish games too. So I started playing them every Friday night on our Twitch channel, and I had a lot of fun. For the most part. No! I landed on you! You fucking liar! I fucking glided, you goddamn piece of shit! I think it'll be interesting to add this new component to Disney Simber because, much like Disney itself, games have changed and evolved. They aren't just simple go and save the princess stories anymore. It, well, okay, there's a little bit more to it. They can have character, they can have depth, they can have worlds they can explore. Or, sure, they can be simple side-scrollers too, but even that has a great art to it. Like a lot of you, I think there is a lot to respect, appreciate, and critique about video games. They've come so far from just two lines knocking a dot back and forth. And Disney being one of the most popular imaginative forces on the planet, no doubt can and has turned in a lot of good stuff. But like the other years, it isn't just video games we're going to be looking at, it's going to be a little bit of everything. Movies, TV shows, Marvel, Star Wars, Fox, old, new, as much as I can fit in. Like I said before, it's been an interesting transitional year, and Disney, let's face it, has kinda helped us through the transition. Fairy tales, superhero, sci-fi, and yes, video games, play a big part for many of us in escaping, coping, or both. There's a lot to talk about this year, so let's not waste any time. This is Disney December 2021, the one where he started doing games. Let's talk about one of the biggest Disney video game phenomenons, Kingdom Hearts. Going into this, I knew practically nothing, except that it had something to do with combining anime with Disney. I remember seeing clips all over YouTube and fan art all over DeviantArt and wondering to myself, what exactly is this? And by God, why didn't I have this when I was growing up? After playing it, I find myself saying, what the hell is this? But why the hell didn't I have this growing up? I would have adored this as a kid. As an adult, I still really, really like it. I feel like it gives what everybody was expecting with this idea. It opens with three children on an island, Sora, Kairi, and Riku. It took me forever just to even figure out this scenario. Do they have parents? We never see them. Is there a society that lives there? It doesn't matter. What does matter is Kairi and Sora, voiced by Haley Joe Osmond, seem to form a strong friendship, and Riku, the teenager, is angsty and likes showing off. One day, an evil force named Ansem arrives, voiced by Billy Zane, who tempts Riku to join his army of darkness because he can get him off the island and show him the world. Um, sure, teen angst, I guess. Kairi is taken and Sora chases after her and suddenly, Donald and Goofy are in the story. Yeah, like I said, this is just kind of how this all works. They say the same time Kairi disappeared, King Mickey disappeared, and they're searching for him as well. So they decide to join forces and hop from planet to planet, each one having a different Disney world on it. Yeah, this really does advertise itself. And they discover more and more Ansem's evil plan, which again, doesn't have a lot of detail except saying the word darkness a lot. Along the way, you have to fight creatures called the Heartless, a rogues gallery of Disney villains, your best friend who constantly monologues between good and evil, and save Kairi who may or may not still be in this world. I know story and character has become a much bigger part of video games in the past few decades, so I guess I'll talk about that first before I talk about the actual gameplay. The story and characters are perfectly vague. There's no real detail to how or why everything is going on. It's just kind of these anime characters interacting with these Disney characters and saving people, fighting off foes, and talks of hearts, and light, and darkness, and honestly, if I was a kid, that's all I would need. It reminded me a lot of that scene in the Ninja Turtles movie where they just close their eyes and suddenly Splinter appears in the middle of the fire. When I'm a kid, that's a real emotional moment. As an adult, it's kind of ridiculous. What do you mean you just concentrate and suddenly your loved one appears in the middle? What, what the hell is this? But it's also Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You kind of know you're not going to take it that seriously. And it still appropriately works okay as an emotional moment. 
if you took that moment and stretched it out to about half the story, I feel like you would have Kingdom Hearts. Kids don't really need that much detail, they just want a good versus bad with maybe a little something complicated in between. A I am your father moment or a I'm not the wizard moment. Something that makes it just a little less black and white. It delivers what needs to deliver with that perfect, vague, childlike innocence. At first I was put off with it, I think because I am an adult, but then I thought if I was a kid, I would be in love with this. Let's move on to the look of the game. Well, look at it. it it's gorgeous. I can't believe this came out in 2002. I mean, these are just mind-blowing graphics for that time. Honestly, they still look pretty good even now. Yes, you can make fun of the faces that they keep the whole time in some of the cutscenes, like how they smile when somebody dies or something, but... When you fly around the clock tower in Peter Pan or under the sea with the Little Mermaid, you really get that feel like you're in those movies. It captured the spirit of them so well. Part of that is not only the great artistry that went into it, I mean, like I said, just look at it, it's gorgeous, but also the voice acting. They did their best to bring in as many of the Disney voice actors as they could, and if they couldn't get the original actors, they found appropriate replacements. There's just something so satisfying about fighting Oogie Boogie and Captain Hook and Maleficent, and it really feels like you're fighting Oogie Boogie, Captain Hook, and Maleficent. I'll also admit this is the first time I've ever played a JRPG, and I thought I was going to hate it. Maybe that's because what comes in my mind is the take turns thing, where somebody hits you. What do you want to do? You want to hit them back. Now you have to wait for them to hit you. I hate that. I'm way too impatient for that. I get people who like it, and I know there's a whole strategy, and good for you. That's fine. You do you. I just can't stand it. So I was really happy to see there is a lot of fighting in this. Almost, I dare say, too much. There's a lot of times where I just would skip the characters because I was so sick of fighting them. Again, I think that's more my impatience. I wouldn't fault that on the game at all. I think people do want to fight these things a lot, especially to grow magic and health and so forth. And that's just a personal preference. With that said, there are a few things that really got on my nerves. And again, part of that might be just when this game came out. The big one is the controls. I was playing Last of Us 2 while I was playing this game, and the controls were so backwards on this game, I had to stop playing the other one. The attack and jump buttons were completely reversed, and I just could not get used to them. And no, there is no option on this re-release that lets you change the buttons, or the volume on the music and stuff like that. That was another issue when we were playing this on Twitch. But okay, I stopped playing the other game and I only focused on this, and eventually I got used to it. But that's not the end. When you get to levels where you have to fly or swim, it isn't like most games where you can kind of work with the camera and project forward. No, no. There's two other buttons that you have to press to go up or down. Thank God these levels look so pretty and had a lot of fun in them, because if not, I would have gone insane. The platforming was also kind of a pain in the ass. I guess this game is kind of infamous for that. Again, for the most part I got used to it, but there are some areas I could just never get it down, and it got me so frustrated, I just... Well, you can see for yourself. Can't climb a fuck- God damn it! The platforming just is I'm not like, straight. God, I fucking hate this! Come on! Is this why you guys want me to come back here so you'd see me fuck up climbing this goddamn tree? This tree is the real final boss. I would fucking believe it! This is fucking ridiculous! Don't fuck- No! Fuck this tree! Fuck this tree! Aside from that, honestly the complaints I have about this game are more nitpicky. For example, I know there's gonna be a lot of going back and forth with these levels, and I get that. They can only make these worlds as big as they can, but in something like the Tarzan level, you'll literally go, somebody will say a line of dialogue, and you have to go all the way back to a place you just came from. They'll say a line of dialogue, then you have to go all the way back to the place you just came from again, and they repeat this like a million times. Even when it starts to get a little better, like they mix it up a little bit and throw in a little bit more creativity, they'll throw in plot threads or character choices that make no sense just so you can go somewhere else and go through the entire level again. I hate it when you work so hard to get through a level and then they have you do it all over again for no reason. It's not the worst, it's just a pet peeve. I think the last thing that started to get on my nerves a bit is that the game is kind of a cock tease when it comes to final battles. 
it keeps making you think you're at the end, or at the very least near the end. And then they kind of pull the rug out under you, and they're like, oh no, no, you still have to go through three more worlds. Like, okay, if there's a surprise boss, I get that. If there's a quick escape level where you gotta get out before everything explodes, I get that too. It's like adding a little bit more. But in this, you fight a dragon. Then you fight your best friend, and you fight them in this really cool new location. You've never seen anything like it. The game should be wrapping up around this point. But no, the mastermind, who's only been a voice throughout most of this that probably should have been saved for another game, comes in and says, you gotta fight me too. Well, okay, one more boss isn't bad, but no, you gotta go all the way back. You have to go through the entire last level again to get to another last level where you have to fight all these little creatures and then you get to the boss and then it looks like he's dead, but no, you have to fight more little creatures and then you have to fight the final boss again, but it's not just fighting him, it's like seven parts to fight this goddamn guy and I don't think there was a save point. I was too afraid to die to find out. But again, that might be my adult mind. I feel like if I was a kid, I would love that this game would keep going and going and having more surprises for me. I think it's the curmudgeon adult that just says, all right, this was fun, let me go to sleep now. With all that said though, I can say I had a good time playing Kingdom Hearts. Is it a game changer? It's hard to say because I wasn't really that big a gamer when it came out. But I can say it's visually dazzling, has a lot of imagination, a fair amount of charm, and just gave me exactly what I wanted out of a game like this. Little anime characters going after big Disney villains. Is the story Bioshock? No, but I don't think it's supposed to be. I mean, Christ, look at the first thing that's said to you when you start walking around the island in the very beginning. Who talks like that? But I honestly wouldn't expect anything less from this idea. Again, Anime meets Disney, of course they're gonna talk like this. Even when I was playing this, people were kind of making fun of the dialogue and how many times they say light and darkness and stuff like that. But again, kind of like that scene in Ninja Turtles, I think that's part of the fun. I liked it, and anyone that looks at this game and says, oh, that sounds like a fun idea, I think you'll like it too. Just keep in mind, everything about it is gonna be focused more on spectacle and enchantment than sense and detail. But if you want to relive the imaginative adventures of childhood, I say, what's wrong with that? I had a good time, and this was only the first part in the Kingdom Hearts... Uh, Kabillion G... I don't know. See you at the next one. For years, and I do mean years, even before I was doing the Nostalgia Critic or anything online, people have been telling me to watch Clone Wars. Yes, it takes place during the time of the prequels, but it's so much better than the prequels. Hell, it actually fixes the prequels. You gotta see it. It's so good. It's so good. But every time I looked at that animation that just wasn't my style and how many goddamn episodes there were, I just said, eh, another time. Plus, how can you fix the prequels? It's impossible. Go away, go away. It wasn't until I started talking about The Mandalorian and I expressed my concerns about having characters from other shows pop up that I pretty much got schooled in the comments saying, no, this has to happen because Mandalorian is tied to Clone Wars, and I said, okay, I'll watch the damn show. And shit, yeah, like everybody said, it's terrific. Like, really, 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 really goddamn good. Even the things I thought I wouldn't like, that it takes place in the prequel universe and that animation style that just looked a little too angular and cheap to me. The more I watched it, the more I really learned to appreciate it. Even kind of love it. The basic story is both very simple and very complicated to talk about. It's pretty much following the good guys Yoda, Obi-Wan, Anakin, and his new Padawan Ahsoka fighting an intergalactic battle against Count Dooku without being aware they have a traitor in Senator Palpatine. And that, I guess, is as bare bones as it gets, but trust me when I say a lot happens in this show. One of the interesting things about it is it is one of the few Star Wars properties that actually feels like, well, a war. There's a lot of strategies, there's a lot of battle philosophy, there's a lot of getting to know your enemy, getting to know your friends. How much do you give up and how much do you hold on to to win? What do you sacrifice? What do you give? What do you take? All stuff that really is a big part of war. 
So many of these characters that were so dull in the prequels are suddenly made incredibly interesting here. Mannequin Skywalker, everybody used to call this character because he really was so wooden and didn't have much in an arc and just switched in a millisecond. Everything they talk about in those little side conversations like, oh, remember when we battled the giant worm shit fuck in planet ass or whatever? And he's like, oh yeah, <laughs> we're such good friends. And it feels really phony and not real. Here, you see them actually fight. You see them interact off each other. Anakin is legit really charming here, and over the seasons, you do slowly see him start to turn to the dark side, and in a way that does make sense. It taps into what Last Jedi was kind of tapping into, where maybe the Jedi aren't always perfect, maybe there are a lot of problems with the way this is set up. And obviously Anakin's turn after becoming Darth Vader doesn't make situations any better, but you can see how he got to that point. Even if... His acting in the first season is a little off, I dare even say Ahsoka's acting is kind of off too. Yeah, actually the first season really gets shit on by a lot of fans. They always say, yeah, just skip the first two seasons, don't even watch them, ignore them. Well, maybe the bar was set so low because of the prequels, but I honestly didn't think they were that bad. The first episode has Yoda, a character that most people can get behind, everybody likes Yoda telling the clones that they're not all the same. Yes, they are literally clones, but through different environments and different interactions, they do form kind of these unique identities that, yes, are similar, but are still different enough to stand out. I found this really intriguing. That was one of the things in Attack of the Clones I thought was so weird. I just had all these questions like, well, wait, do they all think the exact same thing? Or are they kind of different? Do they like what they do, hate what they do? Are they like robots? Can they think for themselves? And this show answers it. I'm really not kidding when I say some of the most interesting characters are the clones. They're all given numbers as names, but they give each other nicknames for short. Like, one is called Fives, because he has a bunch of fives in his number. Another is called Rex, and there's a bunch of different names that you do start to get to know. Enough that when one of them dies, you do legit feel bad. This idea alone was enough to show me that this show did have a brain and was trying to work with the universe that was given to them. Enough that I found myself saying, even though everybody hates the first two seasons, I actually got through them okay. They are probably the weakest, but you can tell they're trying to get their footing and figure out their performances and the look of the show, and I don't know, I think it gets crapped on a little too much. But when the show really gets interesting, I can't believe there was a time when I said, eh, I could take or leave this show. It gets so engaging. Characters that start off okay like Ahsoka really develop and grow over time to a point where I didn't always know what she was gonna do. In the first few seasons, it's kind of obvious, but as it keeps going, it kind of switches things up a bit. She makes choices that do kind of surprise you. Anakin as well, they add so many complexities to the choices he makes and why he looks at certain alien races and worlds and even the Jedi so different than everybody else. And you sympathize with him and know where he's coming from. There's a pirate named Hondo that kind of plays both sides to his advantage. There's a whole bunch of bounty hunters that are just so menacing and so cool. There's a character named Ventress that, yeah, looked okay, but we didn't know too much about her, but then later you go into her backstory and see her planet and find out she's actually the same race as Darth Maul, and oh my god, just the way this planet works feels so... God, I never thought I would say this in something Star Wars recently, but alien. It felt like a fascinating alien world I wanted to know more about. It looked great, it was structured in a fascinating way. It even brings Darth Maul back. And yeah, they bring Darth Maul back, who gives a shit? He just kind of growled and swung a lightsaber around and yeah, it looked cool, but what do I know about this guy? I don't give a shit. He is one of the best characters in this. Suddenly he's like this Shakespearean villain. He goes from almost no lines to having some of the most eloquent dialogue I've heard in years. I know I kind of bashed the animation early on, but it really did grow on me. And actually that kind of cheap look I was talking about got more and more clever because I started to notice the layout of the shots. Obviously the show didn't have a ton of money, so rather than use it on say making the skin look realistic or seeing every little hair stuff like that, they make the shots and the lighting really dramatic. Everything is really stylized, and whenever it gets a close-up or a wide shot or some sort of really intense angle, it draws you in. It works within your limitations and surprisingly makes it a little stronger. With that said, is it perfect? I think it's hard to find any show that works 100%, but yeah, there's a couple of lame things. There are still Jar Jar episodes in this, and God, I didn't think it was possible to hate him more, but they found a way. 
Leave the poor actor who voices this guy alone. He's gone through enough. There also is a long period of time between season six and the final season. And you can tell as the animation has really been up, but the way they do the storytelling is a little different too. Part of the fun of the show is that it did have to work so much in its limitations and get so much story across in such a tight amount of time. Like no line of dialogue ever felt wasted. I think because this was the final season, they did let things go on a little longer and stretch them out, and it makes sense that their big send-off would feel more like a movie than a show. But watching them all together like I did, you can definitely tell a difference, and sometimes it's a little distracting. This whole bit with these Bad Batch clones of being told was written and storyboarded out when they were doing season six, and then when they got renewed, they just whipped it out again, but I don't know, they were either planning for a spin-off when they wrote them, which would be a good idea as the show was gonna be canceled, or Disney forced them to be extra gimmicky so that they can do a spin-off show, everybody being like, wow, I like those characters, I wanna see a series decade to them. Oh, well, here you go, we certainly didn't plan that. They're not bad characters, they just have a little bit of that 80s feel, you know what I mean? Like, I'm the stoic leader, I'm the brainy one, I'm the tough dumb one, you know the drill. But all that aside, it does end on a really strong note. The final arc in this series is grand, epic, and really feels earned. And so much of that is because the series itself is so grand, epic, and earns all the praise that it gets. There's times in the show where they literally repeat the same action sequences. Remember in Attack of the Clones when they're flying around the city and jumping on cars? They do that again, except they actually make you care. Ahsoka's trying to get her stolen lightsaber and they make you understand what that means and why that's important and she teams up with kind of this old timer that, yeah, seems a little lame at first, but then he reveals he knows more than he's letting on and you just love them. You love everybody in this series. Okay, most of them, but still that's damn impressive. This might be the first bit of media I've seen that actually made me say I know what George Lucas was going for with the prequels. I see how this world can be interesting. I see why everything is so polished and clean. It's in contrast with how dirty and run down everything's gonna be after the Empire takes over. I love how aggressive it gets too. The body count in this show is insane. Some of the deaths are very gruesome. They just kinda show half of it the rest is off screen. And okay, I guess if they don't show blood, it doesn't count. They get away with a lot in the best way. There's so much more I could say about this series, and yeah, I guess if you want more detail, you can go and watch the season's vlogs that I did. But all I can say is, I get it now. I understand why people wanted me to see this. I'm glad I got pushed into it. It was worth being bugged about all these years. With that said, if you haven't seen it yet, what are you waiting for, man? Check it out! What are you, stupid? You can watch it right now! Come on! Eh, shit, I really am a fan now. And you should be too, man. Go check it out. It's worth all the hype. Here's a hot take, Encanto is really good. Yeah, I'll apologize in advance, I'm not gonna say anything that surprising in this review, it's probably gonna be the same you've heard from every other critic because, honestly, this movie's very solid. In Colombia, a family discovers this magic candle. It blesses every one of the family members with a special gift. A superpower, if you will, like super strength, or seeing the future, or growing plants, you read comic books, you know how this works. One family member, though, Mirabelle, doesn't have any gifts. Mirabelle starts seeing visions, though, suggesting that the magic is, in fact, fading. So she goes on a grand adventure, uh, kinda, she actually never leaves the house. But the house too is enchanted, containing all sorts of gigantic magical rooms, and she tries to figure out what's going on. This is one of those rare movies where everything is just done right. The animation looks spectacular and the setting is amazing, there is so much color and movement in everything. But it also knows when to be slow and quiet, it doesn't always need to be telling jokes or singing songs or bouncing around, sometimes they can just sit still and have an important conversation. And there's not always sentimental music under it to let you know how to feel, it'll just let the scene play. With that said, when there is music, it's also great. Lin-Manuel Miranda returns to do the songs and they are real foot tappers. Not only are they super catchy and have a real great energy to them, but they do legit help tell the story. If you take them out of the movie, you'll be missing a lot. We don't talk about no, 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 no. 
This is one of those Disney films I can easily see elements of it being used for other Disney properties. The house in this is alive, and even though it doesn't form a face or anything, you can tell what it's feeling by just little things that it moves around, or what means a shrug, or what means it's angry, or whatever. I can totally see a Disney resort doing something like this. Hell, this whole place looks like a Disney resort. Because the songs are so integrated into the story, I can easily see this being a Broadway show. There's so many times where, like, somebody's having this inner monologue in song and everybody else is moving slowly, and I can totally see that on a stage production. And yeah, pretty much any of these characters and ideas can be given their own show or comic or even spin-off movie. I really love the fact that there's a Disney film about all these people getting powers and they don't fight evil, they just help out the community. And you know what, if you do that in an engaging way, that can be very interesting. This movie doesn't even really have a villain in it. I was so waiting for another, wait, you were the bad guy all along? Another stupid twist villain reveal, but no. It really is just about this family trying to learn to be a stronger family. I guess with that said, the only problem I have is kind of a nitpick. It's revealed later that the grandma has a certain connection to her family that in the third act does play a really big part. And I would have liked that focused on just a little bit more, like maybe one or two more scenes addressing that. However, that does tie into the mystery of what's going on, and if they did focus on it more, maybe it would have given everything away. I actually really like how this movie doesn't treat the characters like dumbasses, like when you realize something, usually the character realizes something too. You're not always like 10 steps ahead. But if this is what everything has been building up to, I would have liked just a hint more focus on it. It is there, and it's usually in the background, like a lot of times these problems usually are, but like I said, maybe just one or two other scenes giving attention to that. Aside from that, it really is hard to find anything wrong with this movie. I guess some people might have an issue with finding major conflict in the film, it kind of works like In the Heights a similar way. To me, this stuff is very interesting, like family and friends trying to figure out their own shit and their connections to each other, and what do they help out with, and what don't they, and how do you let someone just grow up on their own or help them out? But a lot of audiences, especially with musicals, like a bigger conflict. They like something where somebody's life is on the line, or they do have to defeat a villain or something like that, so I'm not sure. That might throw a few people off. But for me, it's really refreshing. And when you have a lot of great characters, great ideas, great songs, great story, great animation, great colors, not surprisingly, you're gonna get something that's great. At the time of recording this, I haven't really seen what the public has thought about it yet, so let me know your thoughts as well. Were you enchanted by it just as much as I was, or did it not quite suck you in as much as you were hoping it would? Let me know your thoughts, and if you haven't checked it out yet, dance on in and take a look. So I'm just gonna give you a heads up, this is not the review you think it's gonna be. Don't get me wrong, like all of you, when I saw the trailer for Home Sweet Home Alone, I felt the same anger and outrage that all of you did. Oh my god, have they not learned their lesson now that Disney has bought Fox, they're really doing this. They're actually making Home Alone 6, they're one off from the Police Academy movies. And while yes, this is admittedly a bad film, and nothing's gonna get me to change my mind about that, I will acknowledge it is not nearly as bad as I thought it would be. You might be astonished to find there's several things in this movie that actually work. And while yes, this doesn't ultimately come together, I felt legit effort for it. Like the people working on this were trying to make something good. They were not sleepwalking through it, and they could have. It's Home Alone 6 on Disney Plus. They did not have to try, but they did. And I want to acknowledge at the very least, I felt the effort. The story, which is surprisingly complicated, and yeah, I guess that's problem number one, a Home Alone movie should never be complicated, is a couple is forced to sell their house. They don't want to sell the house as they have so many fond memories of it, but when an English mother and her son named Max enter the house, he points out that one of their old dolls, which I will say is hilariously creepy, is actually worth a ton of money. Through a series of odd events, like I said, it does get a little confusing. The couple realize it's worth a lot of money, but can't find it. They think the little boy took the doll, and wouldn't you know it, at the exact same time, his family leaves him behind. So this couple tries to sneak in, take back what's rightfully theirs, and do so hopefully without being noticed. 
But of course, Max is much smarter than he lets on. Yeah, kinda, he mishears a conversation thinking they're actually coming to kidnap him. And he sets up all sorts of little traps to foil them. And while, yeah, absolutely none of them are funny, some scenes in the first two thirds actually did get a few chuckles out of me. There's surprisingly a lot of people I really like in this movie. Ellie Kemper, Rob Delaney, Keenan Thompson, Chris Parnell, Pete Holmes. Where the hell has he been? I haven't seen him in a while. It's kind of cool for him to pop up again. Even Buzz, the original Buzz, is back in this film. And I'm not gonna lie, out of all the actors you could have gotten to bring back to a Home Alone movie, this is the only one I would legit be interested to see. Buzz, I think, is my favorite character in the films because he actually evolves. He's a bully, but he gets smarter and he talks more sophisticated, and he was played really well. Now granted, he's not in the film very long. And yes, a part of me did think maybe he was gonna be like this evil businessman, you know, like someone who's still a bully but is legit smart. Instead, he's a cop, which, yeah, makes sense, that is a position where he can abuse his power, but he's also still kinda dumb. I can't explain, I was always hoping he'd both kinda get dumber and smarter at the same time, but he does serve one important and even kinda clever purpose. When the police are called to check on the kid, he thinks it's a prank because the house is the McAllister house, and apparently, grown-up Kevin keeps calling him saying the house is being broken into to mess with him. Now, apart from that being incredibly illegal, this is something I totally see grown-up Kevin and Buzz doing. Now, I thought that was a unique way to think outside of the box to make it that, well, everybody can't go and just get the kid. As everybody says, if Home Alone was made now, it'd be over in a few minutes. But this movie, in a strange way, kind of shows there's different pros and cons to doing it now. For example, there's no landline there, so they can't just call the house. But they say, why don't we just call a cell phone? Well, he's too young to have a cell phone. Yeah, some kids have it at that age, but not everybody does. And there are one or two little bits of dialogue that I thought was just a joke, but actually come back into the story. With that said, there's a lot of scenes that are clearly just put in to come back into the story, like it is so forced. In fact, there's so many moments where they literally use the exact same music from the Home Alone movies just to recapture that same feeling. In fact, there's a ton of moments you've seen in the original Home Alone. The mother at the airport trying to get back again, the family just ignoring the main kid. They all feel super forced and manipulative. But like I said, there's a lot of funny people in this movie. And I get the feeling the director would just kind of let them improvise a little bit or rework a line to make it funnier. And a handful of times, it does work. The kid himself is kind of a mixed bag. When he has to work off of other people, I think he's legit funny. He knows how to take a clever insult that's thrown at him and throw it right back in a funny way. But when he's alone, I don't think he can really hold a movie. Something about the line delivery just doesn't work when he doesn't have somebody to work off of. And as you'd assume, a lot of the movie, he's alone. It's in the title. Again though, I have to give the film credit. As soon as he discovers he's alone, what's one of the first things he tries to do? He tries to look up porn. The parents have it blocked and they just move on to the next scene, but again, I gotta tip my hat that they included that at all. But easily the biggest problem is the burglars, because they're not burglars. They're just a nice couple trying to get money to save their house. And that's not fun to laugh at. Maybe if the movie had a really dark sense of humor, or maybe if they reworked it that somehow Buzz was trying to get in. Oh my god, this movie is just Buzz trying to get into this house. I would love the hell out of it. But it's just this nice, awkward couple that, yes, it would explain why they would mess up so much, unlike some of these other people. Like, I just barely bought it with Harry and Marv, but yeah, when you get, like, secret agents and stupid shit like that in the movies, what, they can't outsmart a kid? I do legit believe these two could not outsmart this little boy. But when they have to say lines to each other like, Pam, I'm afraid, and she shakingly says back, Me too, honey. That's not funny. That's legit sad. If Harry and Marv said that, it'd be hilarious, but them? I'm just fucking depressed now. A Home Alone movie should not end with the kid and the people trying to break into his house embracing. And I feel like that's a pretty obvious problem that could have been avoided. But again, to the film's credit, I do feel bad for this couple's predicament. Honestly, I didn't think I would feel bad for anyone in this movie. And while yes, there's a lot of lines that don't get a laugh, there's several lines that do. Enough where I actually did go and checked out who directed this movie. I was curious, why were they actually trying to make this good? I found out it was a guy who did a lot of work on the Borat movies in the Ali G show. 
while yes, that comedy can be divisive, I think it's safe to say it's still funnier than the Home Alone sequels. And it's very unlikely this guy got this job and said, Ooh, Home Alone 6, my fucking dream project. But you can tell he and the people that worked on it tried to turn in the best they could. And while yes, I believe there's no parallel universe where Home Alone 6 can ever be a good movie, I think this film tried a lot harder than it needed to. That's not high praise, but it's still more praise than I think most people would assume they would give a movie like this. So is it worth watching? Uh, only if you're super die-hard curious or a completionist like you just have to see all the Home Alone sequels. I guess I can say if you're looking to hate watch it, you won't find a lack of bad things in it, but I don't think it's going to be the abomination you're looking for either. I guess the crowd that would enjoy it most, outside of, you know, little kids that just need to be entertained for an hour and a half, is maybe people like me that just wants to see a creative crew try their best to save something that's clearly already dead. While it's hard to say that's a recommendation per se, I do find these kind of movies fascinating. So in a strange way, I don't regret seeing it. But if you're looking for a Home Alone movie, it's just as good as the original. One of the all-time Christmas classics. How did Buzz put it? Beat that, you little trout sniffer. Guy is a pretty easy movie to review. It's good. Not fantastic, but not forgettable either. It's just a solid, decent movie. Honestly, I was even wondering if I should review this film, seeing how I don't have a ton to say about it, and everything I'm gonna say is probably the same as everyone else. But then the more I thought about it, there is one aspect I think is very interesting to dive into that I don't hear a ton of people discussing. But we'll get to that in a minute. Guy is an NPC in a video game, only he's not aware of it. He just goes about his everyday life expecting to be killed or robbed or beaten up. You know, stuff that we all sadly do to NPCs when we play video games. One day though, he discovers some glasses that lets him see the video game world for what it is, and he suddenly becomes self-aware. Two of the developers, named Millie and Keys, discover this so-called glitch and try to figure out what's wrong. As Guy becomes more self-aware, he starts to take more chances and questions things. He even starts to form a romantic connection with Millie. But the big bad guy in charge named Antoine not only wants to get rid of this character, but wants to erase all information about it. But it looks like his popularity is growing and more and more people are trying to figure out how this NPC suddenly seems alive. It's a fun idea that definitely takes advantage of its premise, and most of the laughs are pretty good. Ryan Reynolds is 100% believable in this role, kinda like a Truman from the Truman Show type, and he also has a lot of good help from his supporting cast. There's definitely some things that don't work, like if you didn't know Disney bought Fox by this point, trust me, when you watch this film, you'll be more than aware, and it's not like they cleverly do a little wink like, yeah, we know we're making kind of a sellout joke, no. You can practically see the advertisements every single time Star Wars or Marvel is mentioned. It's cringy, but not in a fun way. I also at first really liked the Antoine character, but he overstays his welcome really fast. The performance in the first half is pretty funny, but the more and more they try to make him like a legit villain, the more boring and frustratingly one-dimensional he becomes. Which is fine if they still had some good jokes with him, but they just kind of abandon the humor and yeah, he's a pretty weak foil. I also have one other pet peeve that they're building up this bad guy he's gonna fight at the end, and we're all thinking the same thing, it's gonna be Hugh Jackman, and it's not. He does have a little cameo as a voice, but for all that build up, it should have been Hugh Jackman. But okay, what's the one element I really want to talk about with this movie that I don't see that many people touching upon? Oddly enough, the romance. The romance in this movie is kinda different and honestly a little interesting. I don't think it's great or anything, but it does have the seeds of something really unique. Without going too much into spoilers, the romance between Guy and Millie is almost kind of a romance between three people. I really like that Guy isn't just a character that randomly woke up, there is a reason why he is the way he is. And this leads to not really a love triangle, but it is still a relationship among three people. Uh, kinda. Two of the characters are kind of two sides to one personality. 
you could argue it's similar to what they do with Nine, where all the different personalities, when you combine them, kind of make one human being. And I'm really on the fence about it because it's a really good idea, but it's so good, I wanted it to be in its own movie. This is an idea that someone like Spike Jones or Charlie Kaufman should be tackling. It reminds me of that bizarre subplot in Flubber where like the machine is in love with the inventor and that alone is so fascinating, but it's not the focus of the movie. The focus is slapstick comedy and one-liners and yeah, that's fine, but I really wanted this explored. And what I was really curious about is does this romance technically work? If the whole film was dedicated to it, absolutely, but because this is kind of an action comedy with a little bit of romance thrown in, it is a little tricky to work in such a complicated romance like this. So while I can't say it failed, I do like the three characters involved. It does make me wonder what an idea like this fully explored and realized could be like. I guess what I'm saying is there's a real good idea for a fascinating love story in this, and I think someone should pick it up and maybe explore it more in another story. It shouldn't just be left as a simple rom-com, this idea should really be delved into more. But again, that's really not what Free Guy is. Free Guy is a cute little movie where if you play video games, you'll get some laughs, and even if you don't, you'll get some laughs, and yeah, there's some stuff that doesn't always add up or doesn't always make you laugh out loud, but there is just enough in it to be pretty entertaining. Oh, and as a side note, Fox, stop throwing in one F word in your PG-13 movies. Yes, it worked amazing in X-Men First Class, but now you're trying to do it with everything. It just isn't fresh anymore, and you're not risque for still doing it. Everyone's figured it out now, and it's just getting old. Bitch moan, bitch moan. This really is a fun movie I think you should check out. And while I definitely don't think it's a great comedy, it's definitely good enough to play through. It's the long-awaited Black Widow movie, and I do mean very long-awaited. For years, people have said this character has gotten the shaft, and after waiting what many argue was way too long for her to get her own solo film, only to wait even longer because of COVID, fans finally got the movie they kinda, maybe, sorta wanted. Yeah, the consensus on this film is that it was just another Marvel movie without anything that new or really a ton of charm that a lot of the other movies had, resulting in people either not liking it or saying it's just okay. I'm in the okay park, but I think for different reasons than a lot of other people are. The story is one of those that's really simple but also really complex at the same time. Taking place right after Civil War, Black Widow discovers that the Red Room, the organization that turned her and her sister into assassins, is still alive and well, and her sister is out to get him. Realizing they're gonna need help to take him down, they turn this into a family affair, bringing in their eccentric but still powerful father and mother. And that's... kind of it. I mean, yeah, it does have the typical Marvel stuff. There's like one really bad assassin that's chasing her down, and there's the big action sequences that, yeah, half of them didn't need to happen, but it is what we're here for. And you got the super complicated strategies and one-liners that many argue are starting to show their age in this movie. Hell, they are starting to show their age a few Marvel movies ago. But I don't think that's the issue with the film. The issue for me comes down to what you see. The majority of this film, you just see Black Widow talking with her family. And personally, for me, I like that stuff. The family is really interesting to me. This is one of the few Marvel films where the side characters don't overstay their welcome. Some argue they're even more interesting than Black Widow. I guess I would agree, but I don't know. Part of the charm of Black Widow was she never said much. You could get across a lot in just an expression. She reminded me a lot of Indiana Jones that way. Like I love it in Avengers when she says, You sure about this? Yeah, it's gonna be fun. To me, that was the equivalent of Jones going, uh, uh. Neither of those are clever or funny lines, but they work because that's the kind of characters they are. They're badass, but just do what needs to be done. They keep the speeches pretty short. But there's two important things you don't see a lot of in this movie. One is the action. Oh, there's lots of action, but it is not edited together well. This whole movie has kind of a Jason Bourne identity to it, and honestly, I don't mind that. I think it worked pretty well, and it was different. But when you get to the chase scenes and your eyes don't have time to focus on what's going on and you just see a bunch of stuff shaking and cutting and exploding and you don't even know who's where, that can get very tiresome. But the other important thing you don't see much in this movie, the villain. 
I sometimes had to remind myself who they were even fighting in this movie. Yeah, they said the Red Room, but who's in charge of the Red Room? I think you saw him like once in the distance. You rarely, rarely saw him. If this is the scumbag who's responsible for everything and they're trying to get to and they're trying to stop, I want to see more of him. I want to put a face and a personality to the main threat. And the tragedy is, they eventually do, and he's great. I can't be the first one to say he's like a Russian Harvey Weinstein, but this actor really makes him slimy and disgusting, but diabolical, and he chews the scenery in the best way. But he's only given to us at the last third. Even Lord of the Rings had other villains you could focus on, not just Sauron. Hell, even Sauron had an eye. We didn't even get an eye throughout most of this. There's honestly not even much talk about him, like they're building him up. No, there's like none of that. So that made it really hard to get invested. A quick note too, I have no idea who this character is in the comics, but apparently they were done like Mandarin levels dirty. Like nobody was happy with how this character turned out. I almost forgot this even was a character in the movie, so it didn't really bother me that much. But with that said, I do think the film works just enough. Scarlett Johansson is still great as Black Widow, and all the other actors playing her family are also fantastic. It's another one of those films where there's a long scene where everybody just sits down, talks at a table, and the characters are so interesting, that could be the movie for me. I'd be totally okay just hearing them talk about the past and what it means to be this kind of family. Their strengths, their weaknesses, their failings as parents and daughters. All that stuff I find really fascinating. I also like that they did go for more of a darker look with this movie. I mean, if you were to show me this and tell me it wasn't a Marvel movie, I'd think it was some sort of spy flick or aggressive thriller. I know we've seen something similar in the Captain America movies, but I can't explain it. There's just something a little tougher and more aggressive in the way this is shot and the way it's paced. It really wants you to sit with the misery of what some of these characters are going through. It's not in a rush to get to the next punch or kick. So as a Black Widow fan myself, is this everything I've been waiting for in her own movie? Not really, but I wouldn't just say it's another Marvel movie either. I do think there's a lot of elements that help it stand out. And it did really keep my attention with the main characters and their acting. I guess if you go in with the mindset of it's good but not great, you might find enough surprises in there that make you glad you saw it. Not a glowing recommendation, but it's still a recommendation. Not the Black Widow movie we deserve, but the one we... got. It's Underdog! I know a lot of you are expecting me to hate this one, but you might be surprised to find out. You're right, I hate it. No twist on this one, it's shit. This isn't even a so bad it's good movie, it's just boring, dull, and dumb. I guess I knew a little bit about Underdog. They ran a few reruns on Nickelodeon back in the day, and all I really remember is it took place in a world kind of like Tiny Toons, where people and animals just kind of walked around, and there was a superhero named Underdog, who was just kind of a dog Superman before, you know, dog Superman. And aside from that, all I remember is the catchy as hell theme song, which I think everybody remembers. That's one of the few fun moments in this movie is just hearing that theme song, even if it's done by whatever band of the day was popular, it's still a great theme song. Outside of that, from what I can tell, there's very little that connects to the cartoon. Because this isn't a world where people and animals just walk side by side, it's just the human world, the boring ass human world that's not shot in a way that's interesting or told in a way that's interesting. They just want to do a boy and his dog movie, except the dog is a superhero. Lame balls. It opens on a beagle who works for the police sniffing out bombs, but he isn't very good at it. His nose just finds other things like ham and stuff like that. So he's mocked all the time by the other dogs. But this evil mad scientist and his assistant, played by Peter Dinklage and Patrick Warburton, and like most bad films with Peter Dinklage or Patrick Warburton, they are the only good part of the movie, <laughs> kidnap the dog to run experiments on him, and of course it gives him superpowers. Though he escapes, he has nowhere to go, until he comes across a cop played by James Belushi. He has a son who, tell me if you've heard this, is awkward at school and has a girl he wants to ask out but is too nervous to do so. Once he discovers the dog can talk, they form a very strong friendship and of course the dog works on his confidence while the boy helps him become a superhero. 
But the bad guys return and something something manipulate the dog into thinking the boy didn't love him. It was only for his superpowers. Do you even need to know? This is one of the most uninteresting recycled Disney movies I've seen in a while. And yes, there's a lot of them. I really did think though, this would be one of those that would be passionately bad. Like the effects would be so bad they'd be funny or the acting would be so bad it'd be funny. It's just every textbook cliche with nothing new or interesting added. The dog is boring, the kid is boring, the action is boring. James Belushi, at first I thought was gonna be a nice team up with this dog, he seems to have a lot of heart. But he's quickly taken out of the picture when they introduce the son and it's mostly about him. And he's sadly not that great an actor. Shushine, no. I told you no. It's time to teach you some manners. I guess to the film's credit, neither is the dog. I mean, hearing his voice is kind of grating and it never sounds like he's really into whatever he's saying. Friends? Friends? I don't want to be friends. I'm looking to settle down, to find Mrs. Wright. Yeah, she could be Polly Shoeshine. There's two things that are okay in this movie. One I mentioned before, Peter Dinklage and Patrick Warburton, because again, it's Peter Dinklage and Patrick Warburton. They have such a unique way of delivering their lines and it doesn't matter what they're in, they're always gonna add this level of liveliness that you don't get from anyone else. I really appreciate that even in goddamn underdog, they're bringing their A material. I'm looking for my beagle. Oh, yeah. Does tricks and stuff. I haven't seen him. What was that? My grandpa. He's blind. You're making your blind grandfather move a couch. The other is, I was really surprised at the mouth moving effects. I mean, yeah, how many times have we seen this in kids' movies where they just take an animal with a blank expression and they just move the mouth around? Quite a few, but in this one, it doesn't look quite as fake, at least with the mouth movements. Something about the textures and the way it moves with the rest of the head almost looks like they're really talking. Yeah, almost. You can still tell it's CG, but it does look better than other movies that have tried this. With that said, they never train the animals to look like they're actually engaged in what they're saying. And I know what you're thinking, they're animals, they're not supposed to, and you're used to this, right? Just these animals that look totally clueless and they just throw in a bunch of random lines and we're supposed to believe they're really saying this stuff or thinking this stuff. But I don't know, have you ever seen the Babe movies? Especially the second one? The second one gets really dark, twisted, and emotional, and by God, they train these animals to really make it look like they're saying what they're saying. And to this day, I don't know how they train these things to look so convincing. Even with the mouth movements looking a lot faker than in this film. Those that have had their way with me make their empty promises, but they're all lies. Lies. I'm cold. So even on that level, this movie's unimpressive. So yeah, it doesn't work as a superhero movie, it doesn't work as a boy and his dog movie, it doesn't even work as an adaptation. I mean, the setup is almost entirely different. It's just bad. Not even a watch it on Disney Plus to see how awful it is for laughs bad. It's just bad bad. If you're a fan of the original cartoon, awesome, but if you're looking for a big screen adaptation that's really gonna win you over, there's no need to fear. Underdog sucks balls. Here we go, it's Kingdom Hearts 2, a sequel that, yeah, I think in every way improves on the last one. And this is coming from someone that really liked the last one. Now I should give warning, I haven't played the game previous to this chain of memories, but I did look up what happened in between these games, so I am caught up, and if you haven't played this game, you're gonna go straight into 2, I advise you either play the game or do the same thing I did, because there is some important information in there. With that said, the story is kind of business as usual, with a decent amount of twists and turns. Yes, you still have to save Kyrie again. Yes, you have to go to a bunch of Disney worlds with Donald and Goofy. And yes, there's a ton of those anime tropes, as well as, I guess there's no other way to put it, Kingdom Heart tropes that you've all grown to love. Or hate, I guess depending on what you're looking for. But it does try one or two new and interesting things. For example, you don't start off as Sora. You start off as a character named Roxas. I guess I won't go too much into it just in case you don't want spoilers, but I guess where a lot of people say the first game takes forever to end, this one takes forever to start. For a pretty long time, you're just kind of moseying through this town with your friends and entering little tournaments and solving little mysteries that aren't really mysteries and just kind of hanging out. 
I'll admit a large part of me just wanted to get the story going and see Donald and Goofy and go to the different Disney lands, but I'll be honest, when it was all said and done, I did kind of have a good time during this. The game forms connections the way a game is supposed to, through interactions, through activities, through little side quests. I'm not gonna act like I know these friends inside and out, but there is a strange kind of connection you make. It reminded me a little bit of Last of Us. How when you're around Ellie so much, you kind of check over your shoulder to make sure she's still there and you have to remind yourself it's a game, she's not going anywhere. This was kind of the same thing. You just kind of hang out with these people for a fair amount of time that you do almost form this goofy friendship with them. They're not deep or complex, but just doing stuff with them does make a connection. And when you have to kind of say goodbye, it is a little bittersweet. Being kids, they don't know how to feel about it. Hell, even as an adult, you don't really know how to feel about it because it's a very strange situation, but it's kind of a strange feeling it creates, and I think it's a cool one to introduce to younger people playing this game. When the game does get started, it's a lot of fun. The actual gameplay itself is really improved on. I remember in the first game I would skip over all the little enemies I'm supposed to destroy to get like my HP up and my life force and all that stuff because I just got so bored with it. Here, the fighting is so much more fun. I was looking forward every single time little enemies would pop up because it was just so cool knocking them in the air and jumping up and doing all sorts of new moves. It was a good mix of energy and variety. A lot of old favorites do come back. You get to see Jack Skellington, Hades, Maleficent, as well as some newcomers like Pete, some members of Organization 13, which is like the big, bad supervillains you're supposed to stop, and the wizard Yensid, which yes, I know is Disney backwards, and no, this game did not create that. That was all the way back to Fantasia. I really love, though, how they have Christopher Lee as kind of a villain. It's a long story, but they have Corey Burton as this wizard. As for a while, they kind of look like opposite ends of the same coin. And Corey Burton has imitated Christopher Lee in the past, so this is a really clever choice. I guess I won't go too much into more story, just in case you want it revealed for yourself, but needless to say, there are a lot of complicated twists and turns and surprises, and yeah, for a while I was having a real tough time trying to remember it all, but what I like is when it gets to the end, the information it adds simplifies it more. It kind of helps knowing that one character was really someone else, or this character was actually tied to another, or they're kind of the same person. It's also kind of cool that a lot of these side plots and exposition dumps and everything do all show up at the end. I don't think it's perfectly balanced, like Maleficent and Pete show up at the end, and it would have been cool if we actually did something with them, like fight alongside them or fight them afterward, just something. They're kind of there and then they're gone. With that said, you're either going to get into the complicated story and plots and cliches and tropes, or you're not. I get people who say there's way too much going on, it doesn't make sense, they retcon some stuff, some characters are a little bland. But if you're someone like me that loves anime and Disney and fairy tales and stuff like that, these are tropes you kind of look forward to. I usually compare them to horror films or Christmas rom-coms. Like, yeah, we know they're a little silly, but that's part of the fun. We actually made a drinking game of how many times they say Sora, Donald, and Goofy. Sora, Donald, Goofy! Hey! There it is! And come on, that's such a specific order, the developers have to be aware of that. Like, they're making their own tropes and having fun with it. I was also really shocked that a lot of the game is going back to these worlds, which I was complaining about in the first one. I hated going back to a place I've already been to, but this one mixes it up a little bit. It isn't just going back to the homeworld of Hercules, it's going to the underworld. It isn't just going back to Halloween Town, it's going to Christmas Town. You do get new variations of levels that look very different and are very fun to play. The new worlds are also a lot of fun. Tron, come on, how cool is it to play that video game in a video game? Even some of the side games are enjoyable. I went on and on how annoying the Winnie the Pooh games were in the first one, but in this one, they're really, really fun. I went on and on about how annoying the swimming was in the Little Mermaid level here. It's just a rhythm game with new songs, and one of them's a villain song for Ursula. Come on, this is either going to be your jam or it's not. I mean, okay, if somebody asked me how would you like to spend your free time, I wouldn't say, oh, a Little Mermaid song about bubbles, thank you very much. But if we're doing this anime crossover with Disney characters, why the hell not? It's good variety. I just feel like a dumb little kid again playing something like this without a care in the world. It's like there's a little something for everybody. 
the characters themselves also have a lot more personality. I'm not just talking about the Disney characters, I'm talking about the new ones they introduce. In the first one, I know you spend time on the island, but I still didn't feel like you got to know the characters that well before the story gets going. Here, I feel like I made the connections much stronger. When this guy named Axel shows up, you just immediately know what he's like, and you have fun with him. When Christopher Lee's character shows up, yeah, I'm not saying his name for a reason, you'll see when you play the game. There's this immediate dignity and weight to everything he says, and it makes everything sound important. He sounds important, what you're doing sounds important, even if you're not always sure exactly what it is. Even the scenes you can make fun of, and yes, there is a lot you can easily make fun of in this game, like Goofy dies at one point. That's hilarious, but also kind of keeps with the silliness of the game. What? 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 Goofy. What? What? He's alive? Don't do that to me, Goofy! Don't die with my emotions! What the fuck? Oh, hoo -hoo in a black hood sing. Did somebody mention the door to darkness? <laughs> <laughs> Satan is our lord and savior as we all know. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like you're supposed to laugh at this. There's a world where you travel back to the old black and white cartoons and everything's kind of alive and bouncing and Mickey doesn't really talk and man this is so clever and creative. The difficulty also seems appropriate too. Once again, I was playing this on easy, and for the most part, I was getting through it like a breeze until I hit this one character, who I guess is a very famous character that's hard to defeat in this, and no joke, it almost took me two hours to defeat this guy. But what's so interesting about it is, it was still fun. It was infuriating, but I still took so much joy out of it. It always felt like I could defeat this guy. I just had to change my strategy a little bit. I had to do things a little differently. I had to watch how he moved. Yes, it got me screaming. Yes, I had to hit my punching bag every once in a while, but it's a kind of anger that just makes you want to beat him more and feels all the more satisfying when you finally do. Ah! Don't fucking do it! Don't fucking do it! You raise me! So yeah, overall, I really recommend this game. I will say, if you didn't get into the first one, I don't think this one's gonna sway you, even though a lot of things are better. Did I mention the platforming is also vastly improved? But if you really got into the first game, I think you're especially gonna get into this one. It looks great, it's fun to play, the characters are more developed, even the complicated story kind of brings me back to when I was younger reading like the old X-Men comics, like kids would always show off how much they remember about each character and their backstory. It, it kind of feels like that, like there's a lore to the world somehow. Even if, as everybody brings up, it's not the most consistent. But it's a mix of anime and fairy tales. It really doesn't have to be. It just has to be entertaining and engaging. And it's definitely that. Grab your keyblade and unlock the door. Or the door to darkness, ha <laughs> ha! Sorry, I will never get over that. <laughs> to a pretty damn good time. If you saw my Nostalgia Critic review of the DuckTales pilot, you probably know I liked it a fair deal. But that does raise the question, how's the rest of it hold up? Well, in a time when a lot of shows are being remade or rebooted and they usually range from okay to not that okay, I'm happy to say this one's pretty damn good. Not perfect, but few shows are. The scenario is pretty close to the original. Donald Duck's nephews, Huey, Dewey, and Louie, are being dropped off at their uncle Scrooge's house who, big surprise, doesn't really want to spend time with them. Once they all discover the other has a thirst for adventure, he lets them tag along and introduces them to some other friends who really like adventure. Launchpad McQuack, a pilot known for always crashing his planes, Mrs. Beakley, a no-nonsense bodyguard slash spy slash maid slash kind of everything, and her granddaughter Webby, who's not only obsessed with adventure, but obsessed with any Scrooge-related adventure. Like, if there was the biggest die-hard bookworm Scrooge McDuck nerd out there, she'd be it. Or maybe I should say, the writers would be it. This show is swimming with all sorts of in-jokes, callbacks, homages, satires, cameos, tributes. I feel like you can just call this show In-Joke, the series. 
I'll admit that did kind of scare me as I have seen shows that have gone too much into that territory where they focus so much on the humor they don't really pay attention to the story or characters. But for the most part, they balance it out pretty well. For the most part. The creators know it's important to have your own standalone adventure, just as much as tipping your hat to the original adventures. And they do a pretty good job updating the formula. Every episode has a ton of laughs. I was actually kind of amazed how consistently funny this show was. The writing is very clever, very modern, and very satirical. That's probably the number one most consistent thing that rides throughout all three seasons. But an interesting problem does occur early on. I didn't really see it in the pilot, but as it kept going, it became more obvious. At first, most of the characters are kind of the same. I feel like 90% of the people I can sum up as a mix of cynical and dim. How cynical and how dim depends on what the joke requires. Sometimes a certain character will be smarter, sometimes they'll be dumber. It just depends on what works better for the punchline. True, there are some that are more dim than cynical, and others that are more cynical than dim, but with the exception of one or two characters, they all kind of fall to this category. To the point where where they got to the dramatic season one finale where you're supposed to really feel something, it wasn't really working. It looked cool, and it was creative, but no part of me in the story ever said, ooh, how's Dewey gonna react to that twist, or how's Scrooge gonna react to that twist, or really any of them. Part of that may be they were shown in a different order, and while yes, I feel like that would affect things, I don't think that was the main problem. Particularly because when we get to season two, things improve quite a bit. One of the most important elements that really helped in giving the show a soul is a character named Della, Donald's sister and the boy's missing mother. I'm not gonna lie, there was so much buildup around her that I really had a fear they were just gonna do the very generic, strong female character like that kind of thing with no personality. But she ends up becoming one of the best characters in the show. She really is one of the essential missing pieces because suddenly this whole new level of drama is brought in, as well as kind of a new level of comedy. She's a goofball, she's funny, she's an adventurer, she's always down for anything, but she also has never met her kids, and her kids have never met her. Some open up to her very quickly, but others kind of need more time to adjust. She as well has to adapt to still being herself and going on adventures, but also still being a good mother. And what I like is it isn't just one episode where everybody learns a lesson. It kind of stretches out through the rest of the series. From this point, everybody seems to grow and they grow at a different pace and in their own way. If you want the best proof of this, look at Huey, Dewey, and Louie. In the first season, there was no difference between them. Honestly, I thought they were all the same voice actor at first. But whatever, that's always been Huey, Dewey, and Louie. In season two, though, it's like they realized if you wanted to have something dramatically hit, they had to have more defined personalities. But they do it a little backwards. They give them these hobbies, like Dewey is obsessed with having his own TV show and catchphrase, Louie is obsessed with being an entrepreneur and finding ways to make money, and Huey is obsessed with being a junior woodchuck. And that's fine, but they came up with the hobbies first before the personalities. So their reactions still weren't that distinct. Even then, they didn't always stick with it. I remember in one episode, Dewey and Webby were like the bestest friends. They said everything in unison and did everything in unison, and then it never comes back again. By the third season, though, they got it down. Dewey doesn't just want to be a TV show. He wants to be the center of attention. Louie doesn't want to just make money. He wants to prove he can see things from a different point of view. And Huey wants to be the best junior woodchuck because he's afraid of what happens if he doesn't follow the rules. Suddenly, their hobbies explain not only their interests, but also their insecurities. By the end, they are fully fleshed out characters. How can I tell? Dewey's the blue one, Louie's the green one, Huey's the red one. I have never been able to do that before. I know that sounds like a small thing, but think of all the other incarnations. Chances are you're like me and could never tell them apart, but at the end of this show, you can. The other characters grow in a similar way. First, they start off kind of simple, but they get more and more interesting. Webby, for example, I wasn't that blown away with because it felt like they were just trying to do another version of Mabel, which honestly, I'd be okay with. I like Mabel, but her thing was she got excited about everything. She'd find a passion, jump from thing to thing, and just go 100% into it. It was fun. Webby is only obsessed with Scrooge-related adventures, and okay, I guess it does form a personality, but it's not that funny a personality. But this show kind of plays the long game, and we discover there is actually a reason for this that does have a really good payoff. At least in my opinion. I guess I can see some people getting angry at what they did with her, but... To me, it kind of checked out, and it made her story arc much more interesting, as well as dramatic. 
With that said, other story arcs are changed or sometimes completely dropped. In the first Darkwing Duck episode, they teased that Negaduck is gonna be in the cast, and he never shows up again. The whole Darkwing subplot actually changes gears kind of rapidly. At first, it's this nostalgic TV show about this washed-up actor, but then, without giving too much away, it's suddenly kind of real. There's a real city now with real supervillains, and they kind of tie it into the show as well with this parallel universe ray thingy. Which, by the way, you know was supposed to be a spin-off to other Disney afternoon shows. And it kind of works, but it also kind of gets in the way with what the show was doing before. For example, Goslin comes back. That's cool, I love Goslin. that's a great character, but now she's a little bit too much like Webby, so we gotta change her in this version where she's not quite as interesting. But with that said, so many of the characters and callbacks are done so well. The villains are usually really funny. As well as legit intimidating, every time Magicka showed up, it was interesting to see am I gonna be creeped out, am I gonna be laughing, a little bit of both. But then other times it'll be kinda weak, like I remember Steelbeak being a really funny character in Darkwing, but he's really bland and generic here. I actually kinda wondered how much of it was just Rob Paulson's voice that made that work. There's this other villain that I guess is supposed to be like a Steve Job, Jeff Bezos parody, but he didn't make me laugh that much. Truth be told, there's probably too many characters in the series. It might have done better if they got rid of a couple here and there. But honestly, these problems are just kind of problems a lot of shows have. I mean, yeah, there's always going to be a character you don't get into, or story threads that don't always add up, or maybe it's going in one direction and then suddenly changes the course. But it does sound like they listened to the criticisms and got better as they went along. To the point where when I was watching the end credits of the final episode and I was seeing every character kind of get their curtain call, I realized how really attached to them I became. It felt like a perfect way to sign off and realize what a real fun time you had watching them go on all these adventures. So yeah, I really recommend this show. Honestly, I recommend anyone that wants to do a reboot of anything to put this on. Because this is different than something like Looney Tunes or Animaniacs. Because if you were to ask me who created Animaniacs, I'd say Tom Ruger. If you were to say who created Bugs Bunny, I'd say Chuck Jones, Frizz Freeling, Tex Avery, all of them. If you were to ask me who created DuckTales, I would say which one. They are that distinct, but also so closely connected. If you start off watching it and you're laughing, but you're not super invested yet, give it time. It does get there. It's worth the wait, and yeah, you're gonna get a lot of laughs along the way. Go ahead and grab onto some DuckTales. Woohoo! I have a terrible confession to make. I never got into West Side Story. Make no mistake, it is a brilliant movie, a phenomenal musical. It looks great, it's stage great, it's acted great, the story's great, the music's great. But for whatever reason, it just didn't grab me. Something about seeing these two gangs snapping and dancing like ballerinas, it just never struck a chord with me. But I acknowledge, it's one of the most influential movies ever made. So you can imagine, when I saw Steven Spielberg was doing a remake, I wasn't really that excited. Do I really need to see him once again prove he understands something that I don't think he fully understands? I say all this to emphasize how much I surprisingly enjoyed this film. This West Side Story is a little bit more what I'm looking for. It's tougher, it's more gritty, it's dirty, it's more violent, it's meaner, it's harsher, yet it still has that great music and some really damn impressive dancing. Seriously, the trailers don't do it justice. Watching the dancing in this is like watching a kung fu master fight. It is so sharp, so fast, and so well planned out that a lot of the time I was wondering if it was sped up. This is a film I would gladly watch again just to watch the choreography. The story I don't need to go that deep into, do I? You know what it is. It's Romeo and Juliet. Set in the 50s, except the two warring sides this time are street gangs, the Jets and the Sharks. Once again, two star-crossed lovers named Tony and Maria fall in love and, well, I guess I won't give anything away, but yeah, what you think is gonna happen happens. 
But like in the original, even if you can guess what's going to happen, it doesn't matter as long as it's done really engagingly. And this is. While the original is definitely a big, grand, epic movie, I mean, this is the guy that did like the haunting and the sound of music, obviously everything is gonna look big. This is kind of a smaller looking film. Don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of big shots and again, really big choreography going on, but it really wants to focus more on the personal struggles. You feel like there's a lot of tight shots, there's a lot of people getting in each other's faces. Everything feels kind of tight and claustrophobic because everybody's forced to be squeezed in together in these cities that are being torn apart and rebuilt and other people are coming in and other people are coming out and just from a visual standpoint you understand why these people don't get along. The acting for the most part is all really good. There's nobody I can think of that actually gave a bad performance. Most of them are not only right on point, but some of them are friggin' phenomenal. The guy who plays Rip, I'd be shocked if he doesn't get an Oscar nomination. Which is funny because he always sounds one step away from being John Mulaney in Newsies, but he never quite takes that extra step. A lot of the performances work that way, like man, if they just took one more step this would be ridiculous, but they usually balance it out just enough. Even when it started out and I saw them all snapping and saying, Jets, go! I'm like, oh no, I'm not gonna be able to do this. But as soon as both the dancing and the fighting started, it won me over pretty quick. I'm actually astonished Spielberg has never done a musical before. Half of his movies are shot like musicals. A lot of the cliches or Spielbergisms that sometimes work against him in other movies all work as strengths here. Sometimes his directing, especially lately, can be a little distracting in how kind of whimsically cinematic it can be. Here, it all benefits the film. This is what he should have been doing for like the past 20 years. Does it all work? No. There are a couple things that make it a tad awkward here and there. One sadly is the guy who plays Tony. And I want to emphasize, he does not give a bad performance, he just gives an inconsistent performance. What's inconsistent? Everything. The tough guy routine, the nice guy routine, his singing, his dancing. He constantly flip flop from hitting complete bullseyes to really being off the mark. But here's the thing, this is hands down the toughest role in the movie. In the original, you just have to be a big nice guy who's charming and smooth, and yeah, even that takes a lot of talent. Here, this guy has to be legitimately tough and legitimately charming while also dancing and singing, and he has to look like somebody who wouldn't hurt a fly yet could convincingly kill someone. In a musical. That's supposed to be realistic, but you dance like a ballerina. This is a tough ass performance, but yes, it doesn't always work and it does affect the big emotional ending a little bit. But part of that could be problem number two, and this is sadly one I don't think it can help. The film is long and by God, it feels long. <laughs> This is two and a half hours, and to the film's credit, for the first half, I really wasn't feeling it, but man, in the second half, those minutes start to add up. One of the things I'm not sure either helped that or hurt that is that they switch some of the songs around, and sometimes they really work. I really like There's a Place for Us being sung by Rita Marino from the original West Side Story, and I really like Cool being sung before the battle as opposed to after, trying to convince Riff not to go into the fight. But then there's other weird moves, like I Feel Pretty is done after the big battle. And yeah, on the one hand, it does make it a little bit more tragic, because you know what's gonna follow, but at the same time, I'm just watching the song thinking, Hey, cute, can we get back to the suspenseful crime story you had going on a second ago? On top of that, I will admit, I have no idea what anyone who loves the original musical is going to think of this. I know a lot of folks who absolutely adore the original movie and they have seen it multiple times. A lot of fans of the original have and I'd be lying if I said it might not be difficult to constantly draw comparisons. Why did they go with that line? Why did they put that song here? Why did they shoot it this way? Why did they shorten this? Why did they stretch out that? As someone who didn't really get into the original musical, I got into this fine, but for someone that's a diehard fan, I have no idea what your thoughts are gonna be on this. I can definitely say I do prefer watching this one, even though objectively the original is better, it's more influential, it changed a lot more, it's just a grander movie. But this is stuff that just grabs me a little more, because I really do like musicals, but the ones I like are the ones that really focus on conflict and shit going down, that's why I like villain songs and songs where someone just sings fuck it all, like all that stuff. 
and with the original being so bright and colorful and this one being so aggressive and grim. It's just more up my alley. But what did you think? Did you like this take? Did you think it's faithful to the original? Or did you feel it screwed everything up? Also, let me know if you're a die-hard West Side Story fan. I think it's gonna play a big part in whether or not you like this film. Whatever your thoughts might be, I think it is worth checking out. You'll either see it as an interesting experiment or a decent adaptation with a decent new spin. So you might be wondering, why am I reviewing the Clone Wars movie after I watched the Clone Wars series? It came out before it, didn't it? Yes it did, and from what I heard, it was absolutely awful. It got panned so hard and so many people hated it, I didn't want it tainting my viewing of the show. Which everyone said was amazing and I wanted to ease my way into. So I watched the entire series, which was amazing and finally watched what's, let's face it, a big screen version of the show's pilot. And I'm either preaching to the choir or saying blasphemy, but it really wasn't as bad as I thought it'd be. Now, I can't say it's good, and honestly, I can see why it got panned as a cinematic feature. But after watching all of the Clone Wars, and especially after seeing the same people that worked on that show worked on this movie, it honestly plays out as just kind of a long, awkward episode. It looks like the son of Jabba the Hutt has been kidnapped, and it's up to Anakin and Obi-Wan to save him. They're both surprised, however, to see a young Padawan named Ahsoka, yes, this is her introduction, is thrown into the mix with Obi-Wan assuming that he would be her master, but instead, she says that Yoda recommended Anakin. Anakin, of course, doesn't want to be a teacher, but when he fights side by side along her, he finds there's actually more to her than he originally thought. And they do fight side by side for a while, even though they make it clear the plot is fine job a son, they kind of stay on this planet and fight this other battle for quite a bit of time. Once that wraps up though, Anakin does agree to be her master and they go to save Jabba's son. Coming across all sorts of baddies like Count Dooku, as well as Count Dooku's apprentice, Ventress. Yes, this is her introduction too. With the exception of Dooku, all the voice actors are the same from the show. And they do, for the most part, a good job. Though it is odd, I'm sure like most productions they didn't record everything in order, but it is almost like as the movie continues, the acting gets progressively worse and worse. Almost like they were running out of time and they're like, just go with the first take, it doesn't matter. I know that's not how it's done, but just compare these lines from the beginning and the end. There's been a mix up, the youngling isn't with me. Stop calling me that. You're stuck with me, Sky Guy. I have a far more important mission for you. More important than keeping you alive? Ahsoka. I need you to trust me on this one. I'm not crazy, there is a difference in quality, right? The same can honestly be said for the animation. Sometimes it looks spectacular. Other times they just kind of look like dead-eyed puppets being moved around. But here's the thing, this is a pilot for a show. Yes, it got a big screen release and it should be judged as such, but you can tell it's a lot of people still trying to find their footing and the character's voice and the look of the show slash movie and even if you saw this first, before you saw Clone Wars the series, if you were told this was a TV movie on Cartoon Network, you'd be like, all right, it's fine. But the fact that this was released on the big screen is really unfortunate. Because yeah, as a big screen movie, this clearly doesn't work. It literally opens and closes exactly like a Clone Wars episode. You have the little intro, you have the narrator, and it just jumps right into it. There's no reminder of who the characters are or why they're fighting or even that much of an emotional connection between the characters. I say Ahsoka and Anakin are probably the closest there is, but everyone else is just going from place to place, saying information, doing a fight, a little battle, and yeah, that's kind of what the show was. I mean, yes, it took time for character as well, but they didn't need a ton of it at a time because they had a whole show to explore it and a lot of different situations and battles where that bit of character can come out when you see how they react to certain situations. You know how later in the series they clump episodes together like three or four, it'll show back to back and they're all connected? This feels like a clumsy version of one of those. Like I said, the first third is just fighting this battle on this planet that honestly doesn't have much to do with anything. I mean, okay, I'm sure it's part of the intergalactic barrier, blah, 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 whatever, but just in terms of the story, you don't need it. You can just be told Jabba's son has been kidnapped, here's Ahsoka, go find him. 
but this really is laid out more like a series. With that said, being a fan of the series, there are some things that are kinda neat to see. It is kinda cool seeing Ahsoka meet Anakin for the first time, and yeah, after wrapping up the series, I did kinda forget how young and tiny she was. It's also cool seeing Ventress for the first time, and actually hearing her talk with Christopher Lee, I guess this is the only time he ever actually voiced Dooku in anything animated, is kinda cool. I mean, we've seen her talk to Dooku over and over, and his replacement voice actor is great, but there is something pretty badass about hearing her voice interact with the actual Christopher Lee. With that said, there are some stupid moments too. Jabba's son, for example, is called Stinky. Now, I'm sure that's not his actual name, I'm sure it's just the nickname Anakin and Ahsoka give him, but that's what they call him throughout the entire thing, and I'm sorry, it sounds ridiculous when they're trying to have a serious moment and you hear, I'm concerned about Stinky. Stinky is sick, what are we gonna do about Stinky? It's the stupidest fucking thing! On top of that, because it does feel like a couple of episodes just grouped together, it feels like it goes on forever. This is not an especially long movie, but because it's not laid out like a movie, again, I'm really wondering if these were just supposed to be a group of episodes together. It feels like an eternity to get to the end. But honestly, I was expecting a lot worse. I thought this was going to be on the level of the worst of the prequels. Like, Jar Jar isn't even in this. I will say if I didn't see the Clone Wars series before watching this, I probably wouldn't like it, because again, I feel like it's not really laid out like a film with a beginning, middle, and end. Ironically, the last arc in the Clone Wars series does feel more like the Clone Wars movie. I would love to see that on the big screen. I will say that it is kind of cool seeing the same people that were attached to this also do the show because, like I said, this movie got ripped apart when it came out, so it is really neat to see them go on to a series, something that obviously they were meant to do, and so many fans say this is what saves the prequels, this is actually what makes them better. So that's kind of a cool redemption arc. So do I recommend it? Um... I guess if you watch the show and you just kind of want to complete everything and watch it all, it's not terrible. You can watch it fine and marvel at a few cute little moments, like I said, characters meeting each other for the first time and being introduced. You just gotta sit through a fair amount of not terrible scenes, just underwhelming scenes. Definitely not a good start to a great series, but it is cool to know from this clunky start we get one hell of a finish. Sometimes the best word you can use to describe a movie is delightful. Luca is friggin' delightful. I think everyone's made a comparison that this is kind of like a Studio Ghibli film, and well, and more of the smaller ones like Kiki's Delivery Service or Neighbor Totoro. Hell, it takes place in the town Porto Rosso. And while I definitely agree, I think it also has that Pixar charm to it as well. This is a funny, charming, smaller story that doesn't have quite as much at stake, but I really see that as a plus. You don't always have to travel to the land of the dead. Sometimes just a little sea creature boy wanting to win a race is enough. Why did I say that like it was supposed to sound normal? Okay, the story centers around Luca, a little sea monster who lives underwater with his family but has a yearning for the human world. Yeah, sound familiar, right? Well, trust me when I say that's where the comparisons to Little Mermaid end, because this really takes on its own identity. Though his family tells him he's not allowed to go on dry land, he comes across another sea creature named Alberto, who reveals that when they're not underwater, they take on human form. This already is such a unique idea. It reminds me a little bit of Gargoyles, how like when the sun is up they turn to stone, and when it goes down they turn to real creatures. I really like fictional characters that once you do blank, it results in blank, if that makes sense. Like, it can't just shapeshift whenever it wants or has wings so it can fly. Like, something has to cause something else to happen. It makes the variety of problems and adventures that go on all the more unique. Luca forms a strong friendship with Alberto, who constantly acts like he knows all about the human world, but even he would admit out of nowhere, maybe he doesn't. Luca becomes obsessed with a certain device he sees called a Vespa. A scooter that, upon first seeing it, he imagines can kind of fly. I love this childlike imagination and innocence. Later in the movie, Alberto tells him that the stars are actually little fish in the sky, so he imagines flying the Vespa up into the night sky where fish are swimming next to him. My god, this is so imaginative! 
And it turns out there is a way they can get one by winning this very bizarre race where you have to swim, eat, and bike in that order. They befriend a girl named Julia, who tried doing the race herself but kept throwing up, resulting in maybe my favorite line in the movie. When you quit in the middle of the race? I didn't quit. They made me stop. God, that's good. While training for the race, they do meet a lot of the town locals. Julia's father and cat, who are intimidating but get on their soft sides. An egotistical bully who always wins the race. His henchmen, or hench boys, because all bullies have hench boys. And a town of oddballs that, quite frankly, don't like sea creatures. Oh, not that they're sure any exist, but they've heard stories and just assume they're bad. So while trying to win the race, they try not to out themselves, avoid Luca's parents who are searching for them, and maybe, just maybe, discover what they truly want and understand how to accept and be accepted. I'll be honest, when the movie started, I really didn't think it was gonna be good. It opens with Luca as a fish shepherd, and the fish actually go, bah. Well, yeah, because I've got news for you. This is some lame-ass world building, man. The parents are stereotypical dummies that don't want him interacting with anything new, and yeah, you know what the lesson's gonna be. You should be allowed to interact with something new and different, and aw oh, man, just move on with it. Very quickly, Luca gets to dry land, and almost instantly, it becomes entertaining. Just watching him trying to learn how to walk as opposed to swim is really hilarious, and I love the way it's explained. Point your feet to where you want to go, okay? And then you just catch yourself before you fall. It's like as soon as these two polar opposite boys get together, the film comes alive. Which is so weird, you would think the fantasy world underwater would be more exciting and imaginative, but you can tell this movie's passion is really on dry land and showing off this unique town that is beautiful, but is not really grand. There's something really small and cozy about it, and it's really welcomed. Luca and Alberto obviously are very weird, but everyone in the town is a little weird too. It kind of reminds me of Third Rock, where it would get really old if it was just the aliens acting odd and the people going, what? That's odd. But no, it acknowledges that people are strange too, and that in many respects we're not that different in our oddities. A large part of why this movie works is the acting. Everybody is so on point and so likable and brings such a unique energy. No two characters seem exactly alike, so they can work off each other really well. It reminds me of Simpsons or Parks and Rec, like when something happens, I want to see every character's reaction to it. Jacob Tremblay, who plays Luca in this, has become such a phenomenal talent. It's funny, because I kind of made fun of him in one of these Smurfs movies where, yeah, he was just a little kid, and you can't expect him to really act that fantastic, he's just a little kid. But he's become one of the great child actors, and it really shines in this role. He is so timid, so afraid, but also so polite and so excited for what he's passionate about. I really like how what he's interested in kind of changes in this movie. Usually in films, a character wants something and they try to get it and they either do or they don't achieve it. But in this, he actually kind of changes his mind and goes after something else. Kind of pissing off his friend. That's interesting, it's not a major end of the world thing, but it's still something we all go through and can be done in a dramatic as well as funny way. Speaking of which, let's talk about that relationship between Luca and Alberto. There's been a lot of talk that this film is an allegory of being homosexual or bi or any kind of unique sexual identity. And while I guess Pixar said that wasn't the intent, for me, it's really hard not to see. I honestly thought everyone was gonna be like, wow, they're really putting it out there and making this big leap and kind of spelling it out, but a good chunk of the people didn't see that. They just saw a little story about a kid who wanted this scooter. But that's what I really like about films like this. You can see it either way. You can look at X-Men as these mutants that are trying not to be persecuted against by humanity, but you can also connect it to race, sexuality, or just being anything different that people have been persecuted for. I really feel like that's a strong way to do a film like this. Everyone can see it and get something a little different. And it can have different meanings for them. So yeah, whether you think there is an allegory or there isn't an allegory, it works either way. I always say if there's a scene in a movie that makes me gasp, it's doing something right, because that's not something I do often in film. And there is a scene where one character quote-unquote outs another one. And it legit surprised me, and I felt the heartbreak over it. But at the same time, they don't give you a third act where the character just mopes and dopes and you know everything is going to be better. They legit talk about it and they try to figure it out. It still has the cliches a smaller story like this would have, but it focuses on what's the most interesting about it. And emotional, and funny, and it just really, really works. 
I'm really hoping this film gains an audience similar to something like Kiki or Neighbor Totoro because it really does deserve it. I really hope it doesn't get forgotten or cast aside because it wasn't as large as some of these other big bombastic animated films. Sometimes smaller is better and even more personal. So, if you're in the mood for something that has a little bit of a slow start, but really pays off in every way a family film should pay off, then dive right in and have a good time. a movie where the advertising is a lot better than the film itself? Well, it can work the other way. For years, I avoided seeing Disney's Mighty Joe Young because the TV ads were just so bad. It had that friendly voice Disney narrator saying how it's gonna touch your heart. It showed him, like, sitting on a car and he's a bunch of kids going, All right, Jose! And him nodding like, it is all right. Disney's holiday movie event. All right, Jose! He moved this jeep full of girls out of the way and they're just like, that was so cool! And then our kid is like, that's so fat! Oh, it looked terrible. So much so that when I heard people say it's actually a pretty good movie and it got pretty good critical reviews and everything, I was just like, no, impossible. I just, every time I see it, I think of those terrible commercials. Well, this year for Disney Simber, I finally decided to sit down and give it a chance and... Yeah, I was surprised to find not only is this a pretty damn decent movie, but it actually has the makings of a pretty good Kong film. A Disney family-friendly Kong film, but it's still a Kong film. I'm a big fan of the original King Kong story, so whenever like a variation of it is done, I'm always a little curious about it. While I'll admit I never did see the original Mighty Joe Young, I did find this one in its own strange way did keep true to a lot of the same themes and ideas that Kong films usually talk about. The film opens surprisingly kind of grisly as this little girl's mother is shot by this poacher. She's trying to protect a gorilla named Joe, who bit off the poacher's finger but he can't find him. Years pass and the little girl grows up into Charlize Theron, who still looks after Joe in the jungle and tries to keep him a secret. But as you'd imagine, that's kinda tricky to do. One day a man, played by Bill Paxton, appears, hears all the stories about the giant ape, and wants to take him to a place where he won't be hunted. This of course means introducing him to human beings and, well, you know how these stories go, they don't always mix. She eventually agrees though, seeing how it is only a matter of time before people find out about him, so he might as well be protected. Honestly, faster than usual, they get the creature to the world of humanity. People find out about him relatively quick, and at first, he's actually kind of accepted. There are hiccups here and there, but it's not one of those stories where one little thing goes wrong and suddenly everybody freaks and are trying to kill him or anything like that. They know it's going to be trial and error, and they try to prepare as much as possible, and if something goes wrong, they work with it. As you'd imagine though, something major does go wrong as the poacher comes back and, of course, wants revenge for the monkey taking his fingers. Okay, you know the direction this is gonna go. Somehow Joe escapes, gets out among the people, and causes panic. And the first thing I'll say is, while those scenes in the commercials are in the movie, they're not nearly as bad as they made them out to be. When he's moving that car with all the women in it, they're all screaming and only one is laughing like she's high on something. And they're all looking at her like she's crazy. That's actually a little funny. When he sits on the car, he just does it because a car alarm is going off. And when he finally shuts it up, he gives a little nod. That's cute. And yes, while there are moments where somebody will say, that's fat or something like that, there's not a ton. While I'll admit the script is not beautifully written or anything, there are some elements that really pull it through. One is the acting. Charlize Theron and Bill Paxton are playing this 100% straight, and man, they are 100% committed. At one of the scenes where Joe is clinging on for dear life, look at how they're performing. You just 100% believe they are losing a best friend. The other is the directing. This movie is paced out really well and knows what scenes to focus on and what scenes not to. They don't do that traditional lean you usually see in family films like this where the animal is good and humanity sucks. No, it shows how tricky it is for these two different species to interact off each other. Yes, there's a lot of ways that we're alike, but the little ways that we're different can drastically cost a lot. 
I'll try not to go too much into spoilers here, but there is a scene near the end where Joe does kill somebody. And it's not a big surprise, but I am glad they kept that in. A lesser family film would have cut it out, but this movie knows it wants to be a Kong flick. A big part of that is showing that neither species is 100% savage, but neither species is 100% civilized either. The film also does a good job making L.A. kinda look jungle-ish when he climbs the Chinese theater, which, by the way, did they do that at the premiere? Did they have a mighty Joe Young at the top of the Chinese theater? They really should've done that if not. There is a sense he's just among different types of animals, and again, that we're not so different, but, well, you know the drill. And while I'm at it, the effects on this thing are phenomenal. This is the first time in a while I'm looking at this asking myself, how the hell did they do that? It looks like it's a giant animatronic walking around, but I know that can't be the way he moves and acts. It has to be some sort of force perspective or a mixing of CGI and green screen or something, but I've just never seen it done this well. He looks way too good and convincing for it just to be CGI. There must have been like a puppet with either a couple people inside or one person or something. And I don't know, for a movie to come out in 1998 and I'm questioning how they did the effects for it, that really means something. The expressions on Joe are also phenomenal. He really feels like an animal, but an animal you can kind of read the expressions for. You don't really see him smile big or get sad eyes or anything like that. He reacts like how an animal would react. To where you have to train yourself, okay, that's what happy means and that's what sad means when he makes that face and you pick up pretty fast to it like you would with any animal. The stuff with the poacher at first I did find a little lame, but again, the way they used it in comparing how LA can kind of be like a savage jungle too is very clever. I feel like if this movie was done with a different team, they would have focused on all the stupid moments and just zip past all the stuff that was really good. But it's really the opposite. They focus on the good stuff and zip past the stuff that's kind of lame. The stuff that I'm sure Disney said, no, no, you have to have that in there because it's a Disney film and we want to get kids in and families and stuff like that. And while yes, this is definitely a family film, it doesn't go nearly as dark as the other Kong movies, it still subtly keeps to the same themes and ideas. If you were turned off by the advertising or even the fact that it's a Disney film trying to do a Kong movie, I really do say give it a chance. It's not perfect, but it really is better than it has any right to be. Like I said, I can't compare it to the original because I haven't seen the original, but whether you're a fan of Kong films, special effects, or just family films in general, swing on in because this is surprisingly pretty damn good. A while ago I did a Nostalgia Critic video about whether or not a bad ending can ruin a good film. I get the feeling Cruella is going to serve as an example for either side because man, this is surprisingly a really enjoyable movie. Until the end that is. All the things I hate about Disney remakes and I'm finding more and more people are starting to really hate about Disney remakes, they're mostly absent from this film until the last third. But seeing how this film is 2 hours and 15 minutes long, if two-thirds of that is still really entertaining, that's the runtime of a regular movie, so a large part of me feels I have to recommend it. If you're not someone that lets a bad ending ruin the rest of the film for you. Which, admittedly, I sometimes am, but this film's a little different. Okay, let's get into the details. Cruella is actually born Estella, and yes, she is born with the black and white hair like one of those cookies. And her mother finds that she has a bit of a dark side, almost another personality. He won't guess what she calls her. What do you say to Cruella when she tries to get the better of you? That's right, Cruella. This film's gonna blow. In the opening few minutes, it definitely felt that way when she walks by some Dalmatians. They growl at her. Anita is a childhood friend. This is all stuff that nobody cares about, but they're revealing to us like, Wow, the mystery is solved! But rather quickly it shifts gears and goes refreshingly dark without going into spoilers because honestly, it's hilariously mean-spirited. Cruella is on her own and later befriends two pickpocket boys. They decide to look after her and introduce her to their life of crime. She tries to somewhat turn her life around by becoming a designer, though her education is funded by stolen money. 
and she gets a job in a department store where she catches the eye of Baroness Von Hellman. God, what a great name. She sees potential in this young designer and decides to take her under her wing. Again, without giving away too much, Estella discovers that there's more to the Baroness than she lets on, vows to take her down, and reinvents herself as Cruella. Honestly, kind of sporadically, like one minute she's just kind of talking semi-normal, has a bit of an accent, and then suddenly she walks in with the black and white hair again and starts bossing the two men around. It kind of happens about as quick as Anakin's turn, but there's a lot of cool stuff that comes from it. Her new plan is to upstage the Baroness however she can. Whether it's sabotaging her, making better clothes, trashing her clothes, soon the Baroness becomes old news and Cruella becomes the new it girl. But how does this all connect to killing puppies and making coats out of them? Oh, that's just a story that got out of hand. Yep, this is another one of those, she's not really a villain about one of our favorite villains in any Disney film. It's ridiculous. But again, it's only saved until the last third, and I think that's why I still recommend and enjoy most of this film. When she's being evil, she's still being evil. The sun switch to hero doesn't really happen until the last 20 or 30 minutes. Until then, she's doing mean and vindictive things just because she wants to do mean and vindictive things. It's not like, oh, well, from a different point of view, she's nice. No, she's mean. She's a bitch. She's a terrible person doing all this. That's the fun stuff we want to see, and that's the fun stuff I enjoyed. And when that's the movie I was getting, it was a ton of fun. Emma Stone is having a blast playing a pickpocket, a drunk, a meek designer, an over-the-top drama queen, a heist planner. It's almost like it becomes a different kind of cool film every 20 minutes. For a while, it's a series of unfortunate events, then it's the Italian job, then it's, yes, occasionally, 101 Dalmatians. In a lot of movies, this would be a problem, but every single time it changes gears, you feel like the filmmakers really are having a fun time doing it. Like, they really wanted to make a heist movie mixed with a Disney villain with a 60s or 70s revenge exploitation flick accompanied by weird Tim Burton fashions that are a lot of fun to look at. I don't usually talk about the soundtrack, but it is crazy good in this. Every 60s and 70s punk rock song that they choose is so on point and really gives the film a good energy and attitude. The best compliment I can give this movie is I legit forget sometimes it's a Disney live action remake. I was having that much fun with how over the top, creative, and twisted it was. And to the film's credit, it really feels like the majority of bad stuff was moved just to the third act. There's a part in this movie where I really feel like it could have ended. Like she's on this fashion runway and the Baroness is just looking at her totally defeated. And I was just thinking to myself, man, if it rolled the credits right here, I'd be satisfied. She killed my dogs. And made a coat. If you're watching this and you're liking the movie and the ending can really ruin it for you, I just say, stop it here and tell yourself, she went on to murder puppies. Then you'd easily have the best Disney live action remake, hands down. But it does tag on this unnecessary last part that not only reneges on everything that it was setting up, but really does a lot of the actors a disservice. There's a really nice scene where Emma Stone stops in front of this fountain and gives this big emotional speech, and she does a really great job, but all you're thinking is, man, I wish this movie ended 10 minutes earlier. So, I don't know, I guess I'm still recommending this. I mean, there is still a lot of good movie to see in here. I, I get a feeling even if you don't like where it all goes, there's so much cool stuff that's imaginative and passionate and wonderfully mean-spirited and has such great music and good performances. But I will say, people who hate this movie really fucking hate this movie. A part of me gets it with where it all goes. For me, there was just too much good to take out of it. I was glad I saw it. I was happy to be with these charming characters. I was really rocking to the music. I loved the bizarre ingenuity with the fashion. I adored how it went unapologetically over the top mean until it was neutered at the end. Hopefully you can get an idea whether or not this film is for you, if you can look over the bad note it ends on and look at the pretty kick-ass stuff they had before it. But for me, I still loved two thirds of this movie. And that's still two thirds more than I've gotten out of most of the Disney live-action remakes.
How often do I get an early screening for a Disney December review? A big thank you to those who invited me to Spider-Man No Way Home, and a heads up, at the time of recording this, I have no idea what the public thinks of this movie. So keep in mind, in a spoiler-free review, I have no reactions to compare this to. All I have to give are my general thoughts. And those are, next to Into the Spider-Verse? This is probably my favorite Spider-Man movie. Does it mean it did everything right? Oh god, no. There is a ton you can nitpick and rip apart about this movie, and trust me, I know there's gonna be other videos that do. But the things that work in it work so insanely well, I feel like it cancels them out. I swear this movie watched my review, as well as the reviews of other critics, I'm sure, of all the other films and listened to the criticisms and listened to the strengths and said, yeah, we can fix that and gave me the live-action Spider-Man movie I feel like I've always wanted to see. Last time we left Peter Parker and MJ, he was just exposed as being Spider-Man. The film cleverly doesn't turn everybody against him, it's more half and half. Some people see him as a hero, some people see him as a villain. I personally think this is very clever, seeing how constantly divided we usually are. Nevertheless, all the pressure not only starts to get to him, but his friends as well. Peter goes to Doctor Strange to see if there's a way he can somehow erase everyone's memory that he was Spider-Man, and, well, the spell goes wrong, the shit hits the fan, and suddenly, villains from the past Spider-Man movies arrive. Yeah, I don't think that's a spoiler, it's in all the advertising. And I guess I won't say any more after that, as yeah, that is kind of where it gets into spoiler talk, but... I'll start off by saying one of the things I really enjoy about this movie is that for a good 20 minutes, these characters from the other movies are out of the picture, and I didn't miss them. I was enjoying where the film was going, and all the choices, and dilemmas, and turmoils, and everything else that these kids have to go through. They're not even really kids anymore, they're looking at colleges, and I'm glad they're addressing that they do look a lot older, and that they're slowly entering adulthood. This is the first time I looked at Tom Holland and I'm saying to myself, wow, he's really looking like Spider-Man. But when the villains do show up, it's just as entertaining. I think it goes without saying that most of these villains come from Spider-Man franchises that didn't end on a high note. Most people didn't find their finales that satisfying, especially because they weren't supposed to be finales, but people hated them so much they didn't make anymore. This movie, for the most part, feels like it's giving these characters the finale they deserve, while still being its own unique Spider-Man movie. I said before in the other Tom Holland films that I feel like they were kind of playing the slow game, like it starts off with him as a kid, and they never really feel that epic, like they're unlike the other movies where they're not self-contained, they always tie into the MCU, and we don't get the really big themes and ideas and drama and everything that I really did like in the other Spider-Man movies. But like I said in the last one, I think they were building up to it. Like, this big, epic Spider-Man movie is coming, you just gotta get through a few issues of Peter still establishing himself. Just like the comic did. Well, this feels like that big, epic movie. Because while, yes, there are a lot of fun, lighthearted fights between Peter and Doc Ock and Green Goblin and so forth, there are some surprisingly heavy moments in this film. Heavy moments that, yes, will remind you of the other Spider-Man movies, and sometimes maybe feel a little repetitive, but because these characters are so likable and so well built up, and are telling the story in a different way with different characters in different places and circumstances in different order, still with the same themes and ideas that Spider-Man is centered around, it doesn't feel repetitive. It's kind of like when you see Lilo and Stitch or How to Train Your Dragon, like, yeah, we've seen those kind of stories a million times, but when it's done with these characters and this way, it feels like you're seeing it for the first time. This was the same for me. It felt like it took all the strengths of the other Spider-Man movies, the deliberately slow pace in the Maguire films, the charm and humor of the Garfield films, and the self-awareness of Spider-Verse, and squished it all into this massive celebration of everything that I love about Spider-Man. But I don't want to give the wrong idea, this isn't the perfect movie. There is plenty wrong with it. Characters, particularly villains, change their motivations out of nowhere. A lot of the effects surprisingly aren't that good. They're not all terrible or distractingly bad, but outside of a few action sequences, all the effects look kind of cartoonish, which is ironic, there is a cartoon, and I think it shines a lot better at this because it just needs to look good, not realistic. There's weird moments that I guess had to be edited out for time. I remember there's one scene where a bunch of characters are entering an apartment and somebody's like, where's this character? Oh, he's staying in the truck. And it's never addressed why. I think this movie might be a little too excited to have some of these characters together and maybe they let them chat a little too long, particularly in the last third. I'm saying to myself, yeah, okay, cute. You can trim this down a bit. 
There is a mid credit sequence that I think when you think about it is really gonna piss you off. Like a past film was promising something and then suddenly it's reneged and maybe leading to something else that, I don't know, is a weird direction to take it, but again, that could just be me. Some characters are trapped in places that you say to yourself, I feel like that character wouldn't be trapped in that place for so long. But you're so impressed with how another character trapped that other character that you kinda don't care. The pros in this movie more than outweigh the cons for me. But yes, there are things done in this movie that either changes the lore around that some people won't like, or some characters just do some stupid stuff out of nowhere that doesn't always make a whole lot of sense. But for me, it did everything so right and I was so invested in what was going on that I forgot about a lot of those moments really quickly. This is one of those films I would love to go back and see again with a crowd just to see their reactions. I really do love now that these movies took their time, really let us get to know these characters and their interactions and their friendship and rivalries and so forth, so that when you did get to the big epic movie, it really did feel big and epic. It did what Spider-Verse did and built upon what you already know about Spider-Man, using it as an advantage rather than a disadvantage. So I had a really good time and I think you're gonna have a really good time too. But I could be wrong, what did you think? Do you think it was worth all the hype, or do you think it's another example of Sony trying to squeeze too much into their Spider-Man movies again? Let me know your thoughts by swinging on in and checking it out for yourself. Oh boy, I can't wait to talk about this one. For those not in the know, oh hell, I'm not even sure I'm totally in the know. This game got a lot of hate when it first came out. People were so pissed off and so betrayed, I thought about calling it the Rise of Skywalker of the series. I didn't even play these games at the time and I knew about the hate it got. But the more I looked into it, the more I saw a lot of fans saying, hey, lay off, it's great, come on, it's a good ending. What I'm trying to get across is I have no idea what way to bullshit my opinion to not get a ton of downvotes on this video. Honestly, I feel like with this game, no matter what I say, I'm gonna get a ton of downvotes no matter what. That's just to let you know I'm not being swayed either way, and I'm just gonna be honest like I always am with these reviews. With that said, I thought this game was a lot of fun. Yeah! Yeah! Now before you go crazy, keep in mind I played these games back to back. I didn't have to wait ass teen years and go through a million other side games. I was just playing the main three and watched a recap video of what happened in between. And if you're only playing the main games, by god you need to watch a recap video in between. Also keep in mind I really like the Kingdom Hearts games, but I don't really think about them much after I'm done playing them. I really get sucked in while I'm playing them, I enjoy the world and the characters, and even all the tropes with the complicated story and mix of anime cliches and Disney cliches. With that said, if you hate this game or have a lot of criticisms of it, I'm probably gonna agree with you because there are a shit ton of flaws. They just didn't extract from my overall experience and, I will admit, the flaws in these games are part of the fun for me. The story? <laughs> I'm not even gonna try. No, I'm really not kidding when I say it is comical to try and explain what happens in these games. Even the first two are a little tricky when you get down to it. I mean, there are just some details that you kind of question, but you're not supposed to. It takes a second to catch on. But still, the initial idea you get, like in Lord of the Rings, a lot happens, but what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to get rid of that ring and defeat Sauron. You got it. What's the core of it? You're supposed to save Kairi and Riku. You save them in different ways, but that's ultimately what you're supposed to do. This one, throughout two-thirds of the game, I had to keep reminding myself what the hell I was supposed to do. All I really got was, you're supposed to level up to defeat Xehanort, the ultimate bad guy. There's so many long, complicated conversations in this, which, again, is part of the fun of Kingdom Hearts. They over-explain everything. But yes, when you are constantly fighting all these various creatures and bosses and such, it does kind of take away when you're asking yourself, why am I doing this again? With that said, let's talk about the fighting. The gameplay, personally for me, is my favorite. But I will admit, I'm very biased. As you've probably picked up, I'm one of those gamers that doesn't want to think too much when I'm playing and I just want to go and destroy shit and smash stuff up. 
Which is not to say you can't do other things. You can still use magic and various other moves and summons and all that good stuff. In fact, I think they even add a lot of other variations. But with the exception of maybe curing yourself, they're not really needed. Even in the other games, there were moments where I had to utilize other moves, other potions, other different types of magic or techniques or whatever. With this, all I had to do was level up, and when it said press triangle, I pressed triangle. But it looked and felt really good every single time I did it. So if you're someone that loves rushing in and just smashing the shit out of all your enemies, this is perfect. If you're someone that likes to figure stuff out and you have to use different techniques in order to get through different levels, I mean, you can, but it's not required. This game is surprisingly easy. This is the first time I played one of these games on standard mode, and it still felt like I was playing on beginner. It doesn't really get challenging until the last third, and even then, I got through it fine. There really aren't many moments where I can recall being really upset and screaming at the screen, just let me win, what am I doing wrong, nothing like that. It just took a couple tries, I had to figure out the pattern, and boom, it was done. But it was also super enjoyable, so I really can't complain. It probably goes without saying, and I'm willing to bet even people who don't like this game have to admit this, it looks goddamn beautiful. This game uses Unreal Engine, which I've used all the time in VR, and any time I play a game with this engine, I'm always blown away by how good it looks. In the Pirates of the Caribbean level, sometimes I had to do a double take because I thought it was just a clip from the movie. And naturally, as you'd expect, the designs are really great in this as well. I wasn't really excited to go to a Toy Story level. I mean, what, are we gonna go in a toy store? Well, yeah, and the Toy Story is pretty fucking awesome! I love the variety of different children's playthings that get possessed and try to kill you. And the sheer size and detail is so much fun to explore. This is probably the closest these games have gotten to feeling like you're just playing a movie. Maybe they indulge that a little too much. You've probably heard there's way too many cutscenes in this game. And while, yes, they certainly are right, there is a little bit more to discuss than just that. The cutscenes when characters from the game are talking, I actually surprisingly enjoy. There's a lot of moments of recap, kind of like in a Wagner opera when they'll just take a chunk and sing what happened in the previous ones. But for the millions of games and various characters this has, for me, that was really welcomed. Where I legit start to get pissed off, though, is in the Disney worlds. Everybody watching this has seen Tangled, has seen Frozen, has seen Big Hero 6. And if they haven't, this game is not going to get the essence of them in this amount of time. If you've never seen Frozen and this is your introduction to it, I get the feeling that movie's kind of going to be ruined for you. So yeah, we don't need a shot-by-shot -shot recreation of Rapunzel interrogating Flynn. We don't need to waste a ton of time seeing if Buzz thinks you're a good guy or not. We sweet Jesus on high Mary God Joseph do not need to hear Let It Go Again. And I'll even be the first to say I could stomach it fine if they did something different with it. For example, you see Sora, Donald, and Goofy approaching Elsa. She's about to sing. Maybe if they got like caught in the castle or they were trying to use their own magic powers to not get frozen or not get crushed by the giant pillars and columns and whatnot, that would be kind of fun. But for the most part, you're just watching the damn song. It did get frustrating playing the game and then having to set the controller down whenever a cutscene happened. Because I feel like there's a better way you could utilize this as a game. And it does sometimes. Without giving away too much, there's a character that turns evil about halfway through. And while, yes, it definitely makes sense why, and it turns into a boss battle, the way they explore the boss during the battle makes you understand more why that choice was made. Everything from how the character walks to what the character is saying is explaining the background while you're playing. There's even, I was shocked to find, a breathtaking moment when you're in this kind of purgatory world. You can just go to the next level, but if you explore a little bit, you find these other entities that are also stuck in purgatory. And I'm not even kidding, this is some of the best writing I've heard in anything. Kingdom Hearts, a video game, movies, books, I don't care. These monologues actually really stuck with me after I was done reading them. Oh, Jesus Christ. That crying, I have to find it, embrace it, the sweet weight I carry, shit, I... Hold on! Fuck! Fuck! My dear beloved Bert. 
Oh, oh, no, no. Mm. Holy shit. <coughs> this is the best yeah. stuff in the game. This is the best stuff in any of the games I've played. They are so poignant and so heartbreaking and mean so much because these characters are here. But you had to look for them. It wasn't just shown to you in a cutscene, you had to explore a little bit and you got rewarded. It made the game and the world feel a lot more inhabitable. As I'm sure a lot of people have pointed out, the Disney worlds don't really play much into the story either, but I don't know, I feel like I was kinda used to that with these games. Yes, this one ties the Disney worlds the least into the overall story, and yeah, the more I hear about what they originally had in mind with Frozen, it would have been cool to see them go all the way with that. But with the exception of a couple, the Disney worlds and characters really do kind of feel like chess pieces, which is ironic, you see them actually playing chess in this. When the actual Kingdom Hearts story does get going, which, kind of a spoiler, it doesn't really until the final third. Unless you like the Organization 13 characters coming out and going nee, 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 and then disappearing. I did find myself really getting sucked in. Yes, I did watch a recap of what happens in between these games, and yeah, some of these characters I didn't really see their introductions, but I really felt like I got to know a lot of these characters, and a lot of them really do have satisfactory endings. I like for as much exposition and over-explaining that there is in these games that there are moments where they just need to say very short, poignant sentences that get to the heart of what they're about. I'll say the one thing I legit hated in this one, like I didn't enjoy at all, was the gummy ship stuff. I already wasn't a huge fan of it in the other ones, but I don't know, I sort of saw it as a palate cleanser and it worked fine, I guess. This one, there's a lot more to explore, a lot more requirements needed in order to move forward, and for a game that's honestly been pretty generous in that department to suddenly throw this in in the goddamn gummy ship portion, it really did get under my skin. I don't know, it's probably just a personal preference though. And yeah, I really do feel like that's what this game out of the main three comes down to the most, personal preference. I know, yes, you can technically say that about anything, but the amount of years this goes back and how many fans it's acquired and how many have grown up with these games is going to play a big part in how much you enjoy it. I personally am the most basic bitch gamer. I grew up with Super Mario Brothers, man. I don't really need that great a story or characters as long as it's fun to play and looks kinda nice. Not to say I don't get sucked into games that have really great story and characters, it's just not a requirement for me. So, whenever I did find myself getting emotionally involved, I just considered it icing on the cake. But I know there's a lot of people that really take so much more out of these games, and for you, I don't know what you're gonna think of it. All I can say is, I had a good time. I thought it was fun to play, it looked beautiful, I still followed the story and characters enough, and did get emotionally involved. Honestly, if anything, the hate I've been hearing so much about it really lowered my expectations to the point where I was really surprised I was getting into it as much as I was. So yeah, I'm really glad I've been introduced to these games. I'm not gonna act like they're perfect, but that's also what kind of makes them really fun. I did find myself enjoying it more than just a fun little game to play. I did get into the characters and I did get into the story. But what did you guys think? Do you think these are some of the greatest games ever made or do you think they're overhyped? Do you think they started off great and then turned to shit? Did you grow up with it or just discover it? And what was your acceptance of it either way? Like I said, I'm not an expert on the fan base, so I'd love to know all your different opinions on it. Let me know what you think, and until next time, let your heart be your guiding key. Everybody had an opinion on this. WandaVision was the first new Marvel show to air on Disney+. Plus. The trailers were, needless to say, kind of intriguing. I honestly had no interest in this when I heard the title. I mean, I liked Wanda and Vision fine, but I didn't really need to see him as a show. But as soon as I saw this idea of reliving all these classic sitcoms, but kind of with this dark edge, I almost thought this was going to be like a TV comedy version of Get Out. Like this satire about how everything looks okay on the surface, but as you dive deeper, there's kind of these really dark, disturbing elements going on. And applying that to the world of 
sitcoms where there's literally a laugh track and everybody's happy and things wrap up in a half hour, I thought this was gonna be brilliant. But when it aired, everyone had their own extreme view of it. Some loved it, some hated it, some said it started off great and got really bad, others say it started off bad and got really great. So, now that time has passed and things have calmed down, my thoughts on the show are... Yeah, not that great. But, I don't know. Didn't hate it. I think there's definitely some good stuff in there, and I really love this idea. I just feel like it never took full advantage of it. It felt like they were trying to throw so much at the wall to see what sticks and try to please everybody, and sometimes that works, and it can be done very cleverly, but this time around, it just felt too unfocused. The initial idea, without going too much into spoilers, is that Wanda and Vision seem to be the star of their own sitcom. In the first episode, it has kind of a Dick Van Dyke Donna Reed feel to it, and in the second episode, it has kind of a Bewitched I Dream of Genie feel to it, and every time a new episode starts, they seem to be in a new decade and combine the most popular shows of that decade to represent what kind of domestic problems they're going through. Not surprisingly, as the show continues, we see what's going on in the real world and how this connects to Wanda and Vision's world. And the more it continues, the more answers we get, but then are taken back, but then are revealed again to be what they said the first time. Maybe. Kinda. But not really. Through ethical loopholes. Okay, so let me talk about the good stuff first. They recreate the looks of these shows flawlessly. As soon as they start, you recognize what decade it is, what style of show they're doing, and can even pick out certain elements in the set that are from the shows they're satirizing. I also like that when something different happens that's not representative of what's on the show, the shots change, sometimes the color changes, it mixes things up a little bit more, and you know something's off. The acting from everybody is also really good, especially from Elizabeth Olsen. I couldn't believe how well she could recreate the voices, the looks, the attitudes of these women that were in these sitcoms. I always associate her with being kind of a bland nothing in the Godzilla movie, and yeah, she was fine as Wanda, but I wouldn't exactly say it's phenomenal acting or anything. This series really allows her to shine and stretch what she can do as an actress both comedically and, to her credit, dramatically. The elements I was talking about before showing kind of the dark, disturbing underbelly of these sitcoms is shown later too, but it's not exactly done like you would think. It's not really satirizing how creepy sitcoms can be when you really think about it. It's more like, oh, these people are doing it because someone else just wants them to do it, and I don't know, that sucks out the fun of the commentary you could have had with this. But as I tried to tell myself, I shouldn't judge something on what I want it to be, rather what it is. And for Marvel's first show on Disney Plus that looks like they threw a lot of money into it, this was kind of a risky idea. What Marvel fan was saying, oh yeah, you know what I really want to see? Wanda and Vision in like a sitcom, but it's like all sitcoms and we're constantly going, what's going on? And nobody would say that, yet it hooked everybody in. I know it got my interest, so I really give them credit on that front. But after that, I'll be honest, it just didn't interest me. At first I was hooked in by the satire and mystery of what was going on in the first episode, but then the second episode kinda just does the same thing, with very few clues. And I, it's not like I need a lot of clues to the mystery, I'm fine playing the long game, but they're not giving us much else. The sitcom writing isn't very funny, and I don't care how cheesy a lot of these old shows are, Dick Van Dyke had brilliant writing. Malcolm in the Middle had brilliant writing, and the more we just kept jumping decades and we see them say these unfunny lines, I was just losing interest more and more. Everyone likes to say this show is about grief. Um, sure. Two episodes, maybe. What, are the episodes where the agents are trying to figure out what's going on about grief? Is the episode where they're just putting on a magic act about grief? I guess you could say it's analyzing denial, but is it? It's just kind of showing it, not really exploring it. When it does dive more into grief, it's interesting, but it feels like too little too late. Because they do want to keep the mystery going, we can't really look that much into what someone is going through. Maybe it's one of those things where you have to see it again and you're gonna see all these levels where you really see the tragedy of it and yeah, I tried and no, it's just more unfunny writing. 
Even the agents who are trying to figure out what's going on, we have one that's okay, but not really that memorable. The dude from Ant-Man who let me tell you I've seen on Off the Boat and can be incredibly funny, and he is not funny here. And our own female Matthew Broderick, Kat Dennings. Oh yeah, she gets a lot of screen time in this. You're welcome. When it is finally revealed what's going on, a lot of people complain that the climax had just another generic action scene with laser beams and such, and honestly, I didn't mind too much, at least something was going on. And I actually kind of liked it, it ended in a logic off. Again, I won't go too much into spoilers, but I really enjoy that one character had to outwit the other verbally. He had to make him think and question himself, and I thought that was very clever. Aside from that, there's a lot of talks of letting go and living with the sacrifices that have happened, and all I'm thinking is, yeah, you can talk about it, but are you really? Again, there's so many loopholes where people kind of get off scot-free, even though they should be severely punished. Or characters, they're acting like are dead, but they're not really. This could have been a three or four part miniseries easy, but they just kind of drag it out and have little hints that sometimes pay off, sometimes don't, some are clever, some are dumb. But I just don't feel like I'm getting to know anyone that much better. Okay, look, if you're one of these people that hates this show and what it was building up and not delivering on, I get it. And if I was really invested throughout the whole thing, maybe I'd be really pissed off too. But it kind of lost me early on, so I didn't get that angry. With that said, if you're one of these people that's just stuck in quarantine and sick of what's going on in the world and this was kind of your escape, I get that too. And don't let me, a dumbass who talks about cartoons for a living, take that away from you. I'm just offering the point of view of the impact it had on me, which is not that big. With that said, I'm totally down for more experimental shows like this in the future. Yes, I don't think this one went all the way, but that doesn't mean you can't make a show that doesn't go all the way. I like when a powerful mainstream studio experiments. If it doesn't work the first time, make it work the second time, or the third, or the fourth, just keep trying it. But overall, how this fared for me, it was just a very middle of the road, meh. Ryan the Last Dragon is not a great movie, but I think it's a big step towards a great movie. Had this film had maybe another year in development, I think this could have been one of the top 10 greatest Disney films ever. As is, it's still pretty damn good. In a far off land, evil spirits are turning tons of kingdoms into stone. A race of magical dragons band together and stop the evil demons, but at a great sacrifice. They themselves are turned to stone. The magic that performed this stunt is in this magic gem which a chief named Benja and his daughter Raya are hoping they can use to unite the five kingdoms who don't trust them because, well, they have this incredibly powerful gem. Through a series of events, the gem is split, the evil demons are released again, turning everybody into stone, and it's up to Raya years later to find every piece of the gem and put them back together to stop the evil demons as well as the fighting kingdoms. While traveling to each kingdom, she collects a colorful local, as well as brings back to life Sisu, the last dragon, voiced by Aquafina. So the story already sounds very different from what you would usually see from an animated Disney film. It draws a lot of inspiration from a lot of Southeast Asian mythologies, similar to what Avatar did. But make no mistake, these are very different stories with very different styles. And I wish I could say it does best when it's not doing its usual Disney thing, but that wouldn't be entirely true. Disney's animated films have usually been very good at crafting a story and memorable characters that you would remember years after seeing them. And this one definitely has the story down, like this is a very well laid out story that keeps you engaged and the pacing is good and you want to know what's going to happen. And the characters are pretty good. Raya has a very good reason for not trusting a lot of people around her and Sisu has very good reasons for trusting too much the people around her. Obviously they try to teach each other lessons and they both learn how to listen and also act on not only what they're preaching but also what they're learning. The side characters are also pretty entertaining. Namari is a good antagonist without being a 100% bad guy, and thank god there's not a secret surprise villain in this one. The people they pick up along the way are very funny, memorable, and have good backstories that make you feel for them. And Sisu is pretty funny when she's a human. 
And honestly, I think a lot of it is because they keep that dragon smile, and that just looks funny on a human face. But yeah, there's a lot of times where she tries to get a laugh, and half the time they fall pretty flat. Aquafina has a very energetic voice that clearly knows comedy, so I don't think it's necessarily her fault. I think they were maybe relying too much on her bringing more comedy than what was in the script, though, like, say, Robin Williams, James Woods, or Ellen DeGeneres. But where those three could make a line that isn't written very funny, very funny, I don't think Aquafina's that kind of talent. I think if you give her already funny dialogue, she can see why it's funny and bring the most comedy you can out of it. But if a line isn't already written with good humor, she's not going to be able to salvage it. With that said, she does get a chuckle every once in a while, and when she needs to do the dramatic moment, she does it very effectively. But there's a lot of little details like that that start to add up. Like, there's a scene where she wants to buy stuff, and she's told she can put it on credit. She doesn't really get the idea, and takes whatever she wants, just saying, credit. That isn't something this character would really do. I feel like she would get their addresses, and find out their names, and say, I'm gonna mail you the money, and already try to find a job to pay back the money in that short amount of time. Like, that feels more like the naive, overly trusting character they established. The same thing can be said for Raya, Namari, and honestly, a lot of details of the lesson. I feel like a lot of people have pointed out if you really dissect it, the way people technically trusted each other at the end doesn't make a whole ton of sense. Like, there's other things the characters could have done. This isn't a 100% ethically fleshed out ending. But to me, it's kind of like Lion King. The details of that lesson don't necessarily make sense either, but what do I remember? I remember Rafiki hitting him, saying, was it matter, it's in the past, don't run away from it. That's what I take out of it, that's what most people take out of it. Raya, I think, is the same thing. Through the visuals and the ideas and the ways the characters work off each other, I think people get the general idea. This is one of the few Disney princess movies that doesn't have any songs or fancy dresses or dance sequences. It's mostly a lot of martial arts fighting and roaming distant beautiful lands and hearing a lot of really cool lore. And the movie does it very well. But I will admit when Raya is walking towards the big enemy at the end and the action-packed music is playing and they're really building it up like she's going up the stairs and getting the sword out, I was invested but didn't find it epic. Again, I feel like this movie needed one more rewrite just to tighten things up a little bit and tweak the comedy so characters are more likable and make me care so much that if a character dies, I would gasp. And there's a few characters that are quote unquote taken out of the picture, but you're always kind of aware what's gonna happen. I think if it went a little bigger and bolder and took a few more risks, this could have been a spectacular movie. But again, I don't mean to really downplay it because it is very good. It's visually stunning, very imaginative, I like the characters well enough. Even if, yeah, the Disney style on them doesn't always fit. And it does do well at getting a lot of information to you that I feel like a lot of other movies would muck up. I was always amazed I knew where they were, why they were there, and how close they were to finishing their journey. I remember a long time ago I talked about The Princess and the Frog and Tangled, how each one had a big part of the puzzle. Like, Princess and the Frog had really memorable characters but an okay story, and Tangle had a really good story but okay characters. I remember saying if they combined the two, they could really have something gigantic, and sure enough, Frozen came out, and, well, that was no small movie. So I'm kind of hoping that Raya is like that. It's a step. It's a big piece of the puzzle that's gonna lead to this really giant, enormous film. But for what it is, it's still a pretty good movie. I've seen it three times now because I always come across someone who hasn't seen it yet and wanted to, and every time I see it, the good moments get better and better, and the mediocre moments don't get worse, but they stay mediocre. I wouldn't say this is one of Disney's best epics, but it's a very impressive step on the way there. It's Busboy! I mean Shang-Chi! I'm sorry, that was the funniest joke in the movie. <laughs> Marvel's first martial arts movie, and it's gonna sound weird, but I'm gonna review this in two ways. I'm gonna say what I think the majority of people going to see this movie will think of it, and then I'm gonna say what I think of it. I know that sounds weird, but there is a reason. And don't worry, I don't hate anything in this movie, just you'll see why in a minute. I think if you're a Marvel fan and you saw this trailer and you thought it looked really good, you're gonna think it's really good. 
This movie pretty much delivers on everything it promises. It's charming, it's funny, it's got some decent action. There's some decent moments of character building, particularly with the villain. I'm really impressed how Marvel movies are doing their villains a lot better. The guy is really sympathetic and charming to the point where you're almost wondering why he is the villain, and then as it keeps going, you figure out why. The leads all have the makings of great action stars, uh, for the most part. Aquafina is in this movie, and I'll be honest, the only other thing I've seen her in is Raya, and I thought she was kind of hit or miss there, and yeah, it's about the same here. I can see her getting on some people's nerves, but she did get enough laughs for me, and the movie did know well enough when she needed to say something funny and when she needed to just shut the fuck up. Unlike some other comic relief. This movie made me realize how much I kind of miss these special effects martial arts movies, like The Matrix and Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, and Hero. It's nice to see not only decent effects in a Marvel movie, but decent action. More than decent action, decent martial arts. Like this guy doing all the fighting, he's really, really good. So yes, you see the trailer, you say, that looks like fun, you're gonna have fun. Okay, now to my personal thoughts. When I saw the trailer, I thought this just looked like another Marvel movie, and yeah, I feel like I just got another Marvel movie. Which is still competent and well done, it's just not holding my attention that much anymore. Maybe that's because DC has really been on a roll lately, where they're doing something that's both light and also dark and funny and complex and unique, but also kind of standard. They kind of mix up everything. They're taking more risks. I didn't feel any risks in this movie. Honestly, I felt more risks in Black Widow. That's also a very middle-of-the-row movie, but it had a little bit more of a mean-spirited grit to it. When you think about how many people or even animals die or are tortured just because of this mean-spirited dysfunctional family, that's just personally a little bit more up my alley. And to the film's credit, I don't think it's supposed to be really dark or gritty. It is supposed to be lighter, and that's fine. I just thought a lot of the new elements they added weren't really that interesting to me. Let me also make it clear, I'm a big martial arts fan. I can't even count how many times I've watched so many Jackie Chan fight scenes. I was obsessed with them. I love not only the way they were planned out and the way he moved and the creativity of the stunts, but also the way the camera was. He knew how to plan a shot where you could fully appreciate the movement and the planning behind a great fight scene. You saw all the hard work. The fight scenes are good here too, but I really think this should have been a martial arts movie before it was a Marvel movie. The special effects and green screen and laser beams and dragons and everything else, for me, distract from the flow of the fight. There's one shot where Shang-Chi does like five moves and ends up in this bus driver's seat. That was amazing, I wanted more of that. But the editing either cuts too fast, the background has too much going on, there's too many effects that are distracting you, so I surprisingly wasn't as amazed by it. And it's a shame because you can tell they put a lot of hard work into these fights. I think of something like Hero, that had a lot of effects going on, but the martial arts knew how to be shot. They knew when to do it in slow-mo, they knew when to slow the camera down, they knew when to do it fast. They knew where to have the effects so you could fully appreciate the fight. But again, I'm talking as a 40-year-old who grew up with Jackie Chan movies and is getting kind of sick of Marvel. I'm clearly gonna have a bias. Even the climax felt weirdly underwhelming to me. I'm not sure if the idea is everyone reached like their center calm or something, I don't know, but everyone looks disinterested in this climax. Whether someone's fighting his father or fighting his son or being pulled in by a tentacle monster or riding a dragon, even the music seems bizarrely calm. And yeah, I know you want to mix it up, like you have some heart-pounding scenes and then some emotional slower scenes in your big climax, but almost all of it's done in this soft, underwhelming sound. I just couldn't get that into it. But okay, I really don't want to give the impression I thought this was a bad movie. I don't. When I saw the trailer, I had an idea what this film was going to be, and that's exactly what it delivered. How can I be angry at that? It wanted to give a light, crowd-pleasing Marvel movie with some good action, and that's what I got. Good for you, movie. You made a lot of money, and everybody loved you. And for me personally, there was enough to hold my attention. I did want to know what was going to happen by the end. I just don't think I got into it the same way everyone else got into it. And that's why I really want to review this in two ways, because it isn't just my opinion. I think it's about trying to find what you at home will like. My thoughts aren't your thoughts. I want you to be able to listen to it and say, yeah, you might like this, or yeah, maybe you should skip it. I think the trailer really is a good indicator if you're gonna like it or not. If you say, yeah, this looks like fun, and Aquafina looks kinda goofy, and the effects are a little cartoonish, but that's what I like about comic book movies, then I think you're gonna like it fine. But if you're someone that's kinda getting sick of the Marvel formula, and you wanna see a martial arts movie where they really only focus on the martial arts, even then, I don't think you're gonna hate this movie. It just might not be the mind-blowing experience that some people are building it up to be. 
So if anything, I think I am more recommending it than not recommending it because people really seem to get into it. Just by the law of averages, I think it's worth checking out for that. I don't know, maybe I'm overthinking it. What were your thoughts? Did you think it was fantastic? Think it was just okay? Or maybe there's some people out there that really hate it. I haven't come across them yet, but I'm sure they're out there. I just thought it was fine. No more, no less. Check it out and see if you get a kick out of it as well. Jungle Cruise might be one of the most efficient summer blockbusters ever made. That's not at all to say it's anything great. Honestly, I'd argue the script is terrible. Before a Disney action movie based on a ride starring The Rock and Emily Blunt, it gives you exactly what it knows its strengths are. Silly action, corny jokes, weird effects, and incredibly charming actors being incredibly charming actors. If I were just to read the script version of this on paper, I would despise this. There is nothing original in it. It's like a mix of The Mummy and Pirates of the Caribbean and every lame jungle bee movie known to man. But the directing, editing, and acting all showcase why these people are directors, editors, and actors. They know how to show you what you want to see and do it quickly which is impressive because this is almost two and a half hours, yet it feels like an hour and a half for how efficiently everybody does their job. Emily Blunt and her brother are searching for treasure, specifically a tree whose leaves can heal people. Not surprisingly, they can't get much funding for this because, well, it sounds like a crazy idea and gasp, she's a woman! Which okay, that's not overplayed too much, though The Rock does make way too many jokes about her wearing pants. But one person who does believe him is this, I think German Prince, played by Jesse Plemons? I'm really not sure why he's a prince in this, but it doesn't matter because his over-the-top accent is amazing. The only accent that might be sillier is Paul Giamatti's in this. He owns the boat of The Rock, who gives, you guessed it, jungle cruises. And yes, just like the ride, he makes a lot of terrible puns, but by God, if there's anyone that can make these terrible puns funny, it is The Rock. I used to work in an orange juice factory. But I got canned. Couldn't concentrate. Yeah, they put the squeeze on me too. Blunt tells them that they need to find this treasure. The Rock, of course, agrees, and they come across all sorts of dangers, including the original army of Aguirre that was looking for the treasure, but now got turned into... Okay, yeah, hand-me-down pirate characters, but they're very well-designed hand-me-down pirate characters. Like the pirate movies, there's kind of a theme to what they're transformed into and it leads to different powers and yeah, it's clearly a ripoff, but it's a creative ripoff. With that said, these are all the typical jungle action cliche tropes that you would see in a Disney movie like this. That's ripping off another one that's based on a ride. But the editing in this movie is so quick and clearly wants to get you to what you paid money for, the jungle, the charming actors, and the goofy action, that it's hard not to be impressed with how much it entertains. If you're looking for actual emotional moments or twists in the film that make you go wow or dramatic character moments that really make you think, there's none of that here. But I don't think people wanting to see the Jungle Cruise movie are really looking for that. I almost feel like that's the trap the pirate movies fell in, like they were trying to get too serious. This isn't serious at all. Even when it's trying to be serious, it's really not. There's a couple moments where they go into, like, backstory and why people did what they did, and the actors play it very well, they're convincing, but what you're really doing is admiring how seriously they're taking it while questioning, wait, there's a million things about this that don't make sense. But you also get the idea that they know that, and they're having fun with it. Okay, you remember the Expendables movie, how in the first one you weren't really sure if it was meant to be a comedy or a legit action film, and then the second one it gets a little sillier, and by the third one it's just a straight up comedy and it's not fun anymore? This kind of walks that tightrope. You can tell they know it's silly, but you can also tell they're aware the joke will work if they treat it seriously. Honestly, it feels like there was just a drop of charm that was in the script and the director and editor and actor said, we're gonna do our damnedest to pull out as much of that charm as possible and have it on the surface level. Because anything under the surface level clearly isn't gonna work. And for my money, I think they accomplished that. If I did have one problem with the film, it would be that the climax is a little dull. 
it kind of reminded me of National Treasure, how getting to the treasure was the most fun, and then when you actually got there, it's just in a dark cave, and there's not much to see, and you were kind of wowed by the stuff earlier that this isn't impressive anymore. It's not awful and doesn't ruin anything, it's just not that interesting. But outside of that, I had a real good time. The pacing of this film and what it chose to focus on honestly reminded me of a family-friendly Edgar Wright. Now that sounds like a huge compliment, but I did still say family-friendly. There's no edge to this, there's not much variety in it. For example, Edgar Wright would, yes, cut fast, but then have moments where shots would last really, really long, again, to mix it up. This just gives you the quick shots and the actors having fun. But that's exactly what I was looking for, and I think anyone that pays money to see this film are going to be looking for. I can't act like it's for everyone or that it isn't ungodly stupid, but it was just right for me, and it felt stupid in all the right ways. Terror is another one of those movies that for some reason I would start, really be interested, and then something would always come along to take me away from it before I could finish it, whether it was work or just didn't have time or whatever. Sometimes it was just a matter of finding a really good copy of it, I guess it's kind of rare. Well, this year I finally got a chance to sit down, watch the whole thing, and I don't know if this is going to be an unpopular opinion or not, but I personally think this is the best movie based on a Disney ride. Don't get me wrong, I do enjoy Pirates and Jungle Cruise, but those movies had to change so much you almost can't even recognize them as the ride. In fact, they had to add elements from the movie to the ride just so you can make the connection. With Tower of Terror, everything comes from the source material. You pick up on it right away. The characters, the scenario, the visuals, even the ride! The freaking ride itself is in the movie! It never really dawned on me how strange it is that none of the other movie adaptations actually had the attraction in it. True, it was probably a budgetary reason, but it's great to see. If you're familiar with the ride, you already know half the story. In the golden days of Hollywoodland, the Hollywood Hotel is throwing a great big party. But when lightning strikes the elevator, the party guests suddenly disappear and nobody knows what happened to them. Years later, a junk news reporter, played by Steve Gutenberg, and his niece, played by Kirsten Dunst, are having a lot of fun creating fake stories that you see in stuff like The Inquirer, you know, about aliens and ghosts and so forth. Eager to get his foot back in a real story, though, he's told about the Hollywood Hotel by a woman who was there when she was just a child. She tells him that she knows what happens to the people in the elevator, and when he goes to check out the place himself, a lot of supernatural stuff starts to occur. Slowly but surely, him and the niece see the ghosts, and they try to figure how to help them out. If they indeed want to be helped out, and they're not some sort of evil entity. I guess from there I shouldn't go into too much more detail, as there are some twists and surprises that, yeah, I did figure out pretty early, but I don't think kids would figure it out. I think for younger viewers it would be a legit shock, and I will admit, I did figure out all the details of the twist, so it did legit surprise me as the film kept going on. But even if you do catch on, there is so much charm, atmosphere, and clever storytelling that really makes it a lot of fun to watch. There's one or two moments in this that are legit a little creepy. And if it's creepy to an adult, it's gonna be scary to kids. But still in a family-friendly way. Which means yes, the film can be a little corny and one or two details don't quite add up, but everyone has such a passion and curiosity for what's going on that you get sucked into it pretty easily. The opening alone just hooks you in. The way the music plays and the camera moves and the editing is done, it builds up this really good, fun, creative energy. I don't know, maybe because I always love the spooky rides at Disney, you know, like Haunted Mansion or the old scary Snow White ride and of course Tower of Terror. I love seeing Disney do something that is dark, but it's still something both kids and families can watch and enjoy. Especially when this is, surprisingly, maybe the most mature out of any of these Disney ride movies. A lot of it isn't sword fights or swinging on vines or saving kidnapped kids from an evil demon or anything. The climax is characters learning to trust and forgive each other. While yes, there is a physical risk there too, it wouldn't mean anything if you weren't invested in these characters and their troubles. 
And you really are. Everyone in this surprisingly has an arc, a goal, a problem to overcome. And they're usually addressed by just talking them out, which, yeah, in any other movie would be really boring, but they do a good job fleshing these people out. They didn't even need to add the Twilight Zone element, which I'm sure was like a copyright thing, maybe, I don't know. But it's not really needed. It stands fine on its own. If I had any nitpicky problems with the film, I would say the romance isn't that great. There's technically two going on, and I almost forgot they were even a thing in the movie. And there is one bit of staging that drives me nuts. Kirsten Dunst is trying to stop this elevator from going, and one of the ghosts slips out, and she slips in. It is so unnatural and makes no sense. But wow, if that's my biggest hang-up, this movie is really doing something right. I'm finding more and more that whenever these Disney TV movies try to do something that has a little bit more of a spooky edge, I usually like them a lot more. I don't know if the makers really wanted to do something mean and dark but couldn't, so they tried to put extra effort into the story and characters and what they can get away with, but when I think of Mr. Boogity and Under Wraps and naturally this, I find myself really having a good time. Is it a phenomenal movie? No. Is it like a special effects extravaganza? Clearly not. But for what it is, a Disney TV movie based on one of their rides that's supposed to actually be about the ride and the story behind it. It not only succeeds, it does so in a more adult way than I think the other Disney ride movies that I think are supposed to be more adult. I'd much rather watch these charming ghosts just talk about their past problems than Jack Sparrow stab another zombie whatever. And again, this is coming from a place that likes the pirate movies fine, but there's something to be said when you don't have as big a budget, you have to think a little more clever and make your characters a little more likable and take more from the source material and add more twists and turns. I'm really glad I finally got a chance to sit down and watch this all the way through. I doubt it's gonna be many other people's favorite Disney ride movie, but this is just the stuff I get a little bit more into. Haunted houses, ghosts, troubled pass, people working through those paths with interesting conversations as well as interesting visuals, and a running time that doesn't overstay its welcome. This isn't even an hour and a half long, and it gets its job done great. So, if you're a fan of the ride, or just like spooky stuff that can also be family friendly, this is surprisingly a good one to check out. talk about the Super Nintendo version of Lion King, or is it Sega Genesis? I'm not sure I played it on the PS4, but something about calling it PS4 Lion King just doesn't seem right, especially with these graphics. I don't think I've played this game since it first came out, and I'm happy to report, for the most part, it holds up pretty well. While this wasn't the first 16-bit game to have hand-drawn animation, it was one of the most ambitious. I know you can point to something like Aladdin and say that's even more ambitious because it's like one of the first ones doing it, but some of these graphics and bits of audio were really mind-blowing at the time. This is literally how the game opens. It starts. I know that doesn't look like much, but on the Super Nintendo, that was pretty mind-blowing. <laughs> Though of course pixely, the animation does still hold up pretty well. The controls are very simple and quick to work out, with the game always helping you baby step style in order to get through the level. Again, for the most part, we'll come back to that. One of the cooler things about the game is that you start off as a lion cub, but end as a full-grown lion. And you do end up fighting the same enemies, but in a different way. When you're a lion cub, you just have to hop on top of the hyenas. Kinda like in Mario Brothers. But when you're full-grown, you get to fight them with your claws. And it takes a little time to get their pattern down, but once you do, it is so satisfying taking these things out. And you don't just fight hyenas, you fight a whole bunch of different animals. Which again, you have to utilize a different type of combat, and it is really cool to see. It's cool that you don't just keep bouncing on top of enemies or rolling and roaring. The fighting does evolve as you get older. It might also sound weird, but the music is really good. And yeah, literally all they do, they just take the music from the movie and put it in there, but for a 16-bit version of a giant orchestral score? They capture it pretty well. I can hear any little tidbit and immediately recognize what part of the movie it's from. Ow. 
While I'll admit I'm a little biased as when I was playing this game, I sadly realized I remembered a lot of where to go and what to do. Yeah, fuck algebra. SNES Lion King is what stayed in my head, man. There are two things that legitimately drive me insane about this game. I guess technically they're small things, but they add up. One is the ending. Now I know this is just an SNES game, I'm not expecting like amazing graphics or anything, but even games back then could give you a satisfactory ending. Look at Super Castlevania, look at Legend of Zelda 3. This one I think blew its wad on the graphics in the opening because they literally just repeat the exact same image. Mufasa on Pride Rock. All they did was take little Simba out of it and say, that's now grown up Simba. And to make things even more insulting, they have Mufasa's exact same audio. Everything the light touches is our kingdom. Yeah, this is a troll ending. The other thing I was building up to, there is a part in level two, goddamn level two, that I can never figure out. You're supposed to jump twice, and by God, I never know where I'm supposed to jump or what I'm supposed to avoid. These horrible childhood flashbacks just came back to me about this one goddamn moment I could never friggin' get down. And yes, it drove me a little batty. What am I hitting? What am I hitting? Ah, God! What? It's, I, it's, I, <laughs> Rafiki can't even look at the game over. He's so disappointed. He not even look at He can't even look at it. But that brings us to maybe the best addition of the game, the rewind button or as I like to call it, cheating made easy. I think because the people who release this know that games don't really work this way anymore, where you're given a certain amount of lives, a certain amount of continues, and when you run out, you have to start the game all over again. They cleverly put in an option where if you die, you can just rewind it and do it again. And you guessed it, I exploited the shit out of this. Oh, wait, wait, the miracle of cheating. That's still not gonna make it, okay. Ha ha! <laughs> I love my magic cheating button. I am so impatient now and so used to games that when you die you're just sent back to a checkpoint that this was a digital lightsaber. Literally in the game. The nice thing is, if you are a purist, you can still play this game exactly like you did before, you just don't use the rewind button. But I hated this part so much in level 2 that I used that rewind button and still, I have no idea how I got through it. It's the only part of the game that's aggravating as shit. There you go! But there was no- you saw there was no nest there! There was no nest! There's no magic bullet! No, all the conspiracies are wrong! It's just bullshit! Yeah. But everything else holds up pretty good. It still looks impressive given the graphics for the time. The sound clips from the movie are great, I love the music from the film, I love the level layout. It gets tougher as it goes along, but not impossible. It's just an all-around good game. Want to go back to your childhood and relive it again? Then pick this game up and complete the circle of life. But seriously, fuck that second level. No! What am I hitting? What am I hitting? Oh, you bet your fucking ass I'm continuing. It's funny, WandaVision seemed to really polarize people, they either seemed to love it or hate it. Marvel's follow-up show, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, seemed to have the same reaction with everyone, and that was... Yeah, it was okay. My opinion? I think it's a little better than okay, actually. It kind of had the opposite effect of WandaVision, where with that I started off really liking it and then kind of got sick of it after a while, where with this, it started off a little slow, but got more and more interesting as it carried on. Falcon is handing over Captain America's shield. Even though Captain America trusted him with it, he doesn't feel he has the responsibility or the strength to take it on. But as the saying goes, if great people won't step up to the challenge, others will. So a new Captain America is chosen with John Walker, a decorated member of the army that seems like a perfect choice, but I think we can all put together is not going to be. Meanwhile, the Winter Soldier, Bucky, is finding it difficult to adjust as well. Living so many years as a brainwashed assassin, trying to have a normal life and still do good while everybody sees you as evil, and yeah, maybe you still got some of those old habits in you, can be very difficult. But things heat up when a terrorist group known as the Flag Smashers want things to go back to the way things were before Thanos snapped half of humanity out of existence. Not that they wanted to see people disappear, but for five years half the population just wasn't on Earth, and when they suddenly come back, a lot of problems arose. 
jobs, economy, food, suddenly all these things that were around for half the population now have to be doubled. Falcon and Bucky team up together to try and take down the Flag Smashers, while also trying to see if they can reason with their leader, while also trying to stop the new Captain America from making things worse. The first thing I really like about this show is that it feels like a Captain America show. Every time a Marvel movie comes along, it has kind of a unique identity, like Guardians of the Galaxy is not going to be the same as Iron Man. Thor is not going to be the same as Hulk. The Captain America movies did establish this very clear identity, and that identity is here. This feels more like a spies and espionage show. There just happens to be superheroes in it, and yeah, they have some kick-ass action scenes but there's actually a lot more sitting down and talking in it than you would imagine. And even when these scenes can be a little boring time to time, there was something I appreciated that was taking the time to just sit down, talk, discuss strategies, and really let the magnitude of the mission that's about to be performed sink in. As you'd imagine, there's cameos and surprises and backstabbing and all the good stuff you would hope for in a Marvel spy show. With that said, there are some inconsistencies. For starters, the villain kind of goes back and forth between this really dramatic, I'm only doing this because I have to kind of character, and then kind of a psycho who smiles before she kills someone. She's mostly very straightforward and no-nonsense, and the few times she does smile, it didn't seem in character. Like, she was having fun, but nothing about what they told us about her indicates she would be having fun. I also feel for a show called Falcon and the Winter Soldier, there is a huge imbalance between Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Now don't get me wrong, a lot is set up with Bucky. He's gonna try and go on a date, he's seeing a therapist, he befriends this guy who knows somebody he assassinated. Man, this is a lot to take in. And majority of the show, it's not looked at. It's more him and Falcon trying to get along like a buddy cop movie, which is fine, it's done well. But for so much interesting setup, there wasn't a ton of payoff, at least not continually through the show. They more just kind of shoved it into one episode. Falcon, I will say I never had much interest in the movies, but I did find myself really liking him in this. I'm not gonna lie, the idea of him becoming Captain America seemed kinda lame because I didn't know anything about him, but when they cleverly show you someone who's bad at being Captain America, it's kinda hard to say, yeah, this other guy wouldn't be better, but he's a little bit more than that. He's very reserved, but he's not boring. And I think doing stuff like having the family and this boat that they're trying to get and other little details that can be charming but also a pain in the ass in life really do add up. Maybe a little too much. After a while, I kind of got sick of that goddamn boat. I didn't really remember the names of any of the family members. I kind of got a little bored seeing what his wife was going to yell at him about this episode. These are usually scenes I love in a show like this. I love seeing more of a superhero's personal life, but I feel like they just kind of did the bare minimum with them. They're not bad, I didn't want to see anything happen to them, but I didn't find them super memorable either. The idea of a terrorist group coming from after the snap I think is very interesting. You don't usually think about the social, economical consequences of what happens in superhero movies, and I like when a film does that. They did that in Civil War, and they do it once in a while in these Marvel films if it matches the tone. And it definitely matches here. But again, a touch inconsistent because they make it look like everything was awful five years after the snap. So it's a little weird sometimes to try and sympathize with someone when you were shown for five years everything was miserable. But okay, here's the real reason I love this show. And this is going to sound really weird, but this is the show where the importance of this finally hit me. The Shield. I know that sounds really superficial, but whenever I see someone with a Captain America t-shirt with just the shield, or someone had the shield hanging on their wall or something, I didn't fully get it. I liked Captain America fine, but come on, you got Batman, and Wolverine, and all these other kick-ass heroes, what does Captain America have? Well, to put it bluntly, America. When I saw how everyone treated the shield and how they looked at it, and yeah, sometimes they would talk about it, but majority of the time it was just the stare they would give this thing, it finally hit me its importance. When I see Falcon throwing that shield around and practicing with it, I got chills. It hit me how long that thing had been around, how long it had been gone, when it came back, how important it was, what it survived. When I saw Falcon's kids playing with it while he was waking up, I kind of got this really weird feeling. 
Like, hey, don't touch that. It's a relic, but it's also this symbol that kids can really look up to and be proud of. And yes, a lot of those virtues are challenged in this too when they talk about race and so many other things that can be a problem in America. And naturally, when you see someone misuse it as well, it's very jarring. Maybe you could chalk it up to me just realizing something that everybody else realized decades ago. Me being a dumbass not putting together what a great symbol this really is. But this show did make me realize it. And it wasn't just through people talking about it, it was through people really letting it sink in. Seeing it pass from place to place, used in different ways, and the power of that image really leaving a big impact. I know that's kind of a weird reason to say I think that elevates the show from being just okay to pretty damn good, but for me, that's a big reason. I don't know if other people felt the same way. Maybe I'm the only one who didn't put it together, and if so, fair enough, this is just my experience. But even if you didn't make the connection the same time that I did, it's still a very good show about exploring it. The responsibility of it, who it goes to, who it belongs to, who it doesn't belong to. Will you have the same revelation? I don't know. But either way, this is still a very well put together show, even if it can be a little inconsistent. Fly on in and see why something seemingly so simple can be so important. seems like every Disney summer I do something Winnie the Pooh related, so why not this one? Pooh's Grand Adventure, The Search for Christopher Robin, is actually one of the better of these movies that I've seen. Which is surprising because I guess a lot of critics didn't enjoy it when it came out back in 1997, and I think I can guess why there is kind of one major problem with it, but we'll get to that in a bit, and the payoff I think really overshadows it. The story, like most things Winnie the Pooh related, is very simple. Christopher Robin goes to hang with Winnie the Pooh, but has something very important to tell him. Winnie the Pooh is so caught up in having fun and relaxing and doing nothing that he doesn't really listen that closely. When he wakes up the next day, he finds that Christopher Robin is gone and left a note. It's covered in honey and difficult to read though, so they send it to Owl. He misinterprets it as Christopher Robin has been kidnapped and is in a place called Skull, which very clearly is school. So Pooh, Tigger, Rabbit, and everyone else set out on a journey to go find him, and, not really a spoiler, find out something about themselves along the way. If the story sounds familiar, they would do this again in another Winnie the Pooh movie, which I guess was closer to the book with the Baxen. I'm not really sure if they did this one in the stories, I'm not really an expert on the books. But what I do remember about the books is the almost zen-like simplicity of it. And this movie, for the most part, captures that very well. One of my favorite lines is when Pooh thinks Christopher Robin is gone for good, Piglet says, I'll always be your best friend. Pooh says he is his best friend to do something with, but Christopher Robin was his best friend to do nothing with. The movie is full of all sorts of deep little lines like that. Everyone kind of talks in rhymes and riddles and backwards speak that kind of makes sense but kind of doesn't at the same time. I love that kind of writing, and it's arguably the most in this one than any of the other Wayne the Pooh properties I've seen. The songs are also really good. I tried doing research on the people who wrote them, and I couldn't get a ton except that the guy who did the music I guess did some Sesame Street stuff, and the woman who did the lyrics did a lot of kids' books. So I guess it figures they would really know their stuff and write some really good tunes. The art style very much looks like the Winnie the Pooh show from the late 80s and early 90s. Which means it isn't quite as bright and vibrant as, say, the Tigger movie, but it still has that simple, sketchy look that you grow accustomed to with Winnie the Pooh. So, okay, this sounds really good. What's that one problem I was talking about? So, one of the things I love the most about Winnie the Pooh is that it kinda sneaks up on you. You think it's just a cute little thing for kids, it starts off with the fluffy little song, you know, Winnie the Pooh and all that stuff. And slowly but surely, this emotional subtext kinda slips its way in. I remember when I got to the end of the first Winnie the Pooh movie and Pooh and Christopher Robin sort of have this serious talk about what's gonna happen years from now. It kind of comes out of nowhere, but it doesn't feel out of place. So many random things do happen, some of them deep, some of them not so deep, and they really mix pretty well. This one, from the very beginning, is trying to be that moment. All the conversations, all the dialogue, all the pacing, it's trying to be a special episode, if you will. And yes, the Winnie the Pooh show would do that a lot, but this does it so consistently it almost feels manipulative. 
Everything is being told like it's the most important memory you ever had in your life. Simple small moments aren't always allowed to be simple small moments. They always try to act like they mean something, or this should leave an imprint as one of the most whimsical moments of your childhood. Take for example this scene where Piglet's in a tree and some acorns are falling. Eventually, a ton of acorns fall and they all get swept up in. Well, okay, cute, whatever. Not hilarious, but it feels like a Winnie the Pooh joke. Listen to the music and look at the way they present this, though. Doesn't it just feel like they're trying to hammer in the whimsy? It's kind of like Patch Adams, there's no regular moment, everything is inspiring and magical and it's supposed to carry a ton of emotion with it. And I will admit, at first, that was kind of turning me off. But the more it keeps going, in a strange way, it kind of lightens up. Like when they get to this cave, you see the characters kind of fumbling over each other and making mistakes, and it doesn't feel like it's trying to be magical or anything, it just seems like the characters fumbling over each other and making mistakes. And it works fine. It also doesn't have a forced nail-biting climax like in the Tigger movie where they're gonna fall off a cliff or something. The danger is always in their imaginations. And when you get to the end, it does stick the landing to what Winnie the Pooh is all about. There's this lesson taught early on about how Christopher Robin will always be a part of Pooh, and Pooh just needs to realize that, and okay, come on, you've heard that in a million other kids' stories. It means nothing by this point. But because the setup for Winnie the Pooh is so unique in that the toy, animals, and other characters still kind of exist and interact off each other even when Christopher Robin isn't around, the message does take on a new life. It keeps it vague whether or not Pooh and the others are actually alive interacting with Christopher Robin or if it's all in his imagination. Kind of like where the wild things are, I do think they're in his imagination, but it's so strong and so powerful that they do kind of take on a life of their own even when he's not around. Like he just imagined this adventure happened while he was at school. So, in the context of the story, they really are a part of each other. It's almost like one can't exist without the other. The movie Christopher Robin was kind of hitting upon this too. Like these characters never truly leave because they're developing who you are, and you're developing who they are. That really is the brilliance of the story. And the best adventures are the ones that seem big, but are technically small. The movie makes it feel like days are going by that they're searching for Christopher Robin, but when he finally finds them, it's only been an afternoon. And I love that, like the perception of the kid's imagination through Winnie the Pooh's imagination, the other character's imagination, can be so askewed. Even the lesson Christopher Robin tries to teach Pooh is distributed throughout all the characters. It isn't just about him. I think that more than anything reinforces that this is in the kid's mind. But like I said, that imagination can take on a life of its own. So in the end, yeah, I am really recommending this. If you're a Winnie the Pooh fan and you really get into the psychological and philosophical elements of it, I think you'll really enjoy this. You just have to keep in mind, it's a little heavy-handed early on. And yes, that might be enough to turn some people off to it. But I think if you're a fan of the original books, or heck, even just like the Winnie the Pooh cartoons on their own, I still think you'll enjoy it okay. I know it's not a glowing review, but it is a flawed movie that has glowing moments. So stumble into the Hundred Acre Wood and decide for yourself if this is your pot of honey. Merry Christmas, everybody! What do you mean I haven't done a Disney December on this? This is like my favorite Don Bluth thing. It might even be my favorite Christmas thing. Yeah, I know I talked about it a long time ago in Nostalgia Critic, but really? I've never gone in more detail on a Disney December? Huh. Alright, well, let's do it now! The Small One is an anime as short directed by Don Bluth when he worked with Disney. It probably goes without saying, I absolutely love it. It's honestly a toss-up between this and Secret of Nim, which one I think is the best Don Bluth production. I love it so much, Don Bluth himself actually drew me a picture that I have framed on my wall of it. So yeah, I really mean it when I say this is about as perfect an animated gem you can get. The story centers around a little boy who I'm just now realizing never has a name. Which is definitely intentional, he's supposed to be the every kid. And an old donkey named Small One. Because of his age, the father can no longer keep him around, and so he has to sell him in the market. 
growing such a strong friendship with him, the boy insists that he takes him to the market and sell him himself. And the rest of the special is just him going from person to person, trying to find the right one to take him in. But seeing how this is a Don Blue story, of course, everybody is a bigger jackass than the actual jackass in the story. This is a time where there aren't that many people who are very kind to animals, and they certainly show it as they either call him names, or kick him aside, or abuse him, or even try to kill him. And that's honestly about it. Again, it's one of those stories where all sorts of terrible things happen to these two little wide-eyed innocents, and it just makes you all the more teary-eyed when you get to that happy ending. Which I won't ruin, but you can probably put together what it is. I don't even know where to start with this. Everything in it is such perfection. The animation, stellar. Look at these reactions. My god, every time the boy says he doesn't want to give the donkey away, it rips your heart out. Even though Small One doesn't talk, he has such personality, and you really do see the strong friendship these two have formed. The music is also amazing. Not only does the musical score just tug at your heartstrings in every single moment, but the songs range from ridiculously catchy to absolutely beautiful. I still get chills every time the boy sings about finding someone special that'll take him in, reassuring him that while that person will be hard to find, it's gonna be worth it. Then when we say goodbye, they'll be in my place. And again, without giving too much away, the music at the end fills me up every single time. It's one of the most satisfactory endings to anything I've ever seen. The voice acting also has a lot of Disney classics like Thurl Ravenscroft, Hal Smith, Gordon Jump. These are all voices that aren't household names, but you always recognize them when you hear them. No, no, little boy, I will not buy. That's a sorry bag of bones, I fear. Small One is another one of those stories that I saw when I was a small one myself when I was a little kid. And I always found myself drawn to these stories where things are always going wrong. It always gets really dark and depressing and sad because it makes the good moments all the more triumphant and you're all the more thankful when they come about. You really feel like you went through something. You experienced something important. When you're a kid, you can't always explain it, but you feel how necessary it is to go through these moments. Don Bluth never shied away from that, but he also didn't shy away from the beautiful moments. It gives you the reward you deserve. It isn't like the Robert Zemeckis Christmas Carol where it goes so much into the dark stuff that it becomes overbearing and the joyful stuff isn't really focused on that much. This one takes you through the ringer, but it gives you that incredible amount of humanity at the end. And you feel stronger getting through the rough stuff to get to the good stuff. It feels earned every single time. I could honestly talk forever about how good this is, but really the best thing to do is go to Disney Plus and watch it again. It really is the little kid equivalent of It's a Wonderful Life. So if you haven't had a chance to check this out, definitely do so. It's more than a Christmas classic, it's an absolute masterpiece. watch a movie that you checked out simply because of the title. Like, you know deep down it's probably gonna be bad, but the title is just so strange you have to know what happens in it. The Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars is that for me. For years I've been so interested in seeing how the hell this very small innocent series goes from a little toaster and some appliances trying to find their human master to going to a fucking different planet somehow. I always had this on my Disney Simber list, but it always had to get bumped back because something else would come out that I thought just made more sense to review. But now, I've finally done it. This 40-year-old man willingly put on the brave little toaster goes to Mars. And the only thing weirder than that? It's actually kind of okay. <laughs> I don't have any irony behind that or one of those it's so good it's bad reasonings. I'm 100% honest when I say The Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars is surprisingly sort of charming. It starts off with the toaster and his appliance friends in the new home of their master and his wife. I'm sure some sort of adventure happened in the last one, but I didn't see it because, I'm not gonna lie, I just wanted to get to this one. 
At first, it really seems to follow the narrative and feel of the original story. A new baby is brought into the home, the appliances don't really know how to react to him, especially the electric blanket. But over time, and a surprisingly really sweet song like, I don't even like babies in movies, but this song about one almost gets you teary-eyed, the appliances all learn to love him. Even though the animation is a little less quality, it's still very similar to the original, and again, it really tries to capture the original's tone. There's a lot of quiet moments, there's not a lot of zany music, a lot of it is just these appliances talking to each other, and it seems to work fine. But as you imagine, things get pretty goddamn weird pretty quick. Someone or something from the planet Mars comes on down to Earth, abducts the little baby, and the appliances decide it's their job to go and save it. They figure out the baby is on Mars, and they just grab some random appliances around the house to build a spaceship. Yep, these simple household items put together launch you into space. Okay, so this is where the movie either wins you over or completely loses you. To me, they're making it clear there is absolutely no reality in the rest of this. Not that there was a ton in a series about a talking toaster, but it still lives in a normal reality that just happens to have talking appliances in it. This one, not a drop of that. But because of that, it allows the writers to get really, really imaginative with it. When they go into space, what's the first thing they come across? Balloons. Why? It's all the balloons that kids had that they eventually let go of and they fly into the sky. And if you were a dumb little idiot like me when you were a toddler, you always wondered, where'd those balloons go? Logically, they couldn't just lose air and drop back to Earth. No, no, they had to keep going into space. And this movie is more than happy to indulge that idea. It's thinking like this that is so silly, I absolutely love it. When they do finally get to Mars, they come across the baby and also some other appliances. Including the top of a Christmas tree. How did they get there? Well, I guess I won't ruin it just in case you haven't seen it, but needless to say, it is very bizarre and complicated, but also a little funny. So, okay, what's next? It's gonna be a big battle, the Earth appliances fight the Mars appliances? No, Mars is a democracy, so they have an election! Yes, the big third act of this movie is the toaster campaigning to be elected the ruler of Mars. What, what can I even say to that? This movie is so crazy, but it's clearly written for little, little kids, and with the characters being about as charming as the first one and these ideas just being so creatively insane, how can I not say that's not incredibly entertaining? I don't know why they decided space was the next option to go to with these movies. Maybe they started watching the Leprechaun films. But if a team of good writers were given the assignment to write The Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars, this is probably the best script you could get out of it. It doesn't just phone it in. It does think outside the box. I feel like you kind of have to with such a crazy ass title. I say the only major hit and miss is the songs. Yeah, that first one about the baby was really good, but the ones after it almost sound like those improvised songs on whose line is it anyway. Like, you can tell they have very little time to work on this. But man, if that's the worst I can say about this movie, that's pretty damn impressive. If you have little kids and they've seen the other movies, I'd say this is definitely a good one to have them see. If for anything else, it just might have them thinking about stuff a little differently and opening up their imagination more. If you're an adult and you like the first movie and you have even the tiniest interest in seeing this, I'd surprisingly say you might have a good time. If you don't enjoy it legitimately, you'll enjoy it ironically, because this is just absolute bonkers. So yeah, I never thought I would say this, but I recommend The Brave Little Toaster Goes to Mars. I know that's surprising. As surprising as finding out one of the head writers of Animaniacs was actually the voice of the toaster. Yeah, I finally just put that together too. I don't know if I was just in the right mood or if this is a legit, really well-written sequel, but if you're in the mood for a small little story about a toaster that travels into outer space, I don't know why you would be, but this movie's got you covered. It's the worst Marvel movie ever! I guess? I suppose Iron Man 2, Thor 2, and Captain Marvel just aren't a thing anymore? Well, okay, when this movie came out, it was absolutely destroyed by critics. 
and it led to a lot of bad press going in. Oh my god, this is the lowest rated Marvel movie on Rotten Tomatoes. What's gonna happen? And the answer was, not much. I mean, people that saw this movie either kind of liked it okay or didn't like it that much, but nobody was really that passionate about it. Truth be told, I think the most passionate critical response I've seen is my own, which is, I kind of love this movie for how bad it is. But honestly, I think I'm the only one to have that opinion. Thousands of years ago, these alien life forms, known as the Eternals, are sent to Earth to protect it from these other alien, demon, dog, alien thingies. More CG Marvel bad guys who look like shit. They're instructed not to interfere with Earth's history unless it has anything to do with these demon, dog, shit CGI things. Which they still do interfere with quite a bit. I mean, there's a lot of inventions they're giving them and sometimes they're like, no, no, that's too advanced, scale it back. I definitely call that interfering. But in present day, the evil aliens come back, and the Eternals have to figure out why. Cutting back and forth between present day and the course of history, we see how this quote-unquote family change over the years, grow a strong bond, and of course question when it's right to interfere and when it's right not to. Okay, so let me talk about the good stuff about this movie, because there actually is quite a bit. The ideas in this film are great. There's a lot of good questions being brought up about what it means to be a god, but let a civilization grow, and when do you interfere, when do you not? To blend in, they all have to look a little different. For example, one is like this little kid, and she has to stay a little kid forever, and over thousands and thousands of years, she gets tired of that. When they see humanity do awful things to themselves, they don't get in the way, and yeah, sometimes the things they break down over, I kinda say, well, wait, you've witnessed the history of humanity, this is what finally broke you? Like one character breaks down seeing the atom bomb, like, oh no, I never should have trusted them, and yes, that's a biggie, don't get me wrong, but if you watch the history of humanity and what they build and why they build it, this shouldn't be that big a shock. Like, a lot more people have died and been tortured. Do you history, bro? Oh, okay, anyway. There's one guy who becomes a Bollywood actor, and the way he gets around, never aging, is that he keeps saying it's his father or his grandfather, and yeah, the looks just seem to pass on through the genes and stuff. That's kind of clever. I like this as a Marvel film that's taking itself more seriously. It's going slower. There's a lot of conversations, and the acting is definitely more serious than other Marvel films, and I gotta give them credit for that. They are really trying to give a more mature movie. This is one of those movies where you could show five minutes from any part, and you wouldn't be able to figure out what's wrong with it. It looks totally fine. But when you realize that five minutes is all the movie is, then the problems start to make themselves very clear. To a point where, like I said, I think it's kind of comedic. Everyone has that same monotone way of talking that you hear in something like The Matrix films, or sometimes Christopher Nolan. There's so many speeches, so much cutting around, and everybody just looks so serious, and they take the time to really let the moment sink in, like, wow, that was a big thing that happened, but every single one of these characters is boring and the same. With the exception of the Bollywood actor, who sometimes gets a laugh, but yeah, he gets a little annoying after a while, too. And this other guy who's looking to start a family, and yeah, I think it's just because he's the only one that's not talking with that monotone. Everyone else is completely the same. The comparison I always make is that it's like an X-Men movie if all the characters were Cyclops. But wait, didn't I say this is one of those so bad it's good movies? Like, how can you watch five minutes and be okay with it? And that's the entire movie, so it should all be okay. Well, I know this is gonna sound strange, but it's a subtle kind of bad. When you really question why these characters do what they do, how they do it, and the fact that they never change their expressions over all these years, it starts to become really funny. There's one character that makes fun of somebody, and so she changes him into a baby, giving him like the bonnet and bib and all that stuff. And he completely with a straight face looks down at himself and says, Oh, I'm a baby. It is so flat and awkward, it's amazing. The opening shot is these cave people and they see like a monster heading towards them and the father just turns to the blank faced son and says totally calmly, run. And the monster just eats him like a shark eating Samuel L. Jackson. It is hilarious. Even the different ways these actors act bland is kind of fun. Seeing them all discuss what a strong bond they have, yet showing it in no emotional way, I'm sorry, really cracks me up. But like I said, I feel like I'm the only one. There were so many scenes in this movie where they would just cut from thousands of years ago to present day with almost no rhyme or reason, and I would just start laughing, and I was the only one in the theater doing that. 
I just couldn't help it. There was such a sense of self-righteous importance that was so not hitting the emotional mark, all I could do was laugh. With that said, I will say I observed kind of an interesting reaction to this film. From what I could gather, I didn't find a lot of people who hated this movie or loved this movie. Like I said, they either just liked it okay or just missed the mark a little bit for them. What got me thinking about this is that the first part of Dune was released this year too, and that was another film where a lot of people just sort of very blank face talk to each other and there's a lot of conversations, and yes, the visuals were nice and the music was nice, but there wasn't a ton of action. And people really got into it. Now even though I like that film a lot more than this, it does strangely get me excited that maybe people are opening up more to this, or that Game of Thrones crowd that doesn't really have a Game of Thrones to watch on TV right now, so maybe they're watching it at the movies. If that's the case, I'm weirdly excited to see where more big budget films are going to go. While yes, I do see The Eternals as a bad movie, it does have a lot of promise. Maybe we could see more movies of big characters having big conversations about big ideas. And yeah, I still like a lot of action, but if you don't have much conflict or interest behind it, it doesn't matter. Which is ultimately the problem with this movie. But if a lot of people were like, yeah, I like the ideas and I want to see more stuff like this, I am weirdly kind of excited. I wouldn't mind seeing Marvel or really any kind of big budget movie go more in this direction. Just, you know, give us some people to like. You're usually pretty good at that, Marvel. But again, I can't act like I didn't enjoy this film, I just don't think it's on the level they were intending. When one of these demon turds kills one character that I couldn't care at all about but then suddenly forms a human face and says, I understand now, my mission is clear even though this thing has never talked before, this just cracks me up. It is just the right amount of weird and it expects you to follow along perfectly. Like, no, no, we know when to let these moments sit and when to just rush into the next one. And they clearly don't, they have it 100% backwards. But like I said, I think I'm in a minority on this. I think the people who don't like it just see it as very dull, and the people who do like it see it as good enough. I see it as one of the first subtle bad movies. The same way you see a subtle good performance, like some people don't see what's so great about it, but you're like, no, 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 really pay attention to it. Look at the little details and the little touches. It's the same thing here, just bad. So yeah, I don't really know if that's much of a review in terms of letting you know if you should see it or not. I guess I would say give it a chance, if for any other reason, just to hear kind of the interesting ideas and get a conversation going, it is a fun movie to talk about. But I guess the one thing we can all agree on is that if this is the new Marvel direction, it's definitely missing the key epicness. the trailers for the movie Ron's Gone Wrong, you probably thought the same thing I did. This looks... fine. Just another story about a boy and his robot, those are surprisingly common. <laughs> How there's something wrong, and there's a secret that needs to be hidden, and there's a friendship that's gonna grow, you've seen the story a million times. Truth be told, I probably wouldn't even check it out if it wasn't released by Fox, and well, Fox is a part of Disney, so I have to do it for Disney December. But I am so glad I did, because I am really not joking, this is a fucking great movie. <laughs> not perfect, but pretty damn close. I went into this film with no expectations and I found something that was funny, clever, heartwarming, surprisingly earning its PG rating, and containing a lesson that I think is more relevant now than it's ever been. The story centers around a kid named Barney, an awkward middle schooler who doesn't have the latest toy. A small robot who will not only be your friend, but forms their personality around the kid's personality, can take pictures, change its design, and of course, post all of it online because that's what really matters. Even though that wasn't the original plan of its inventor. He really wanted a toy that'll give kids a permanent friend for those that can't really form that many friends. But another owner of the company, and more the businessman who wants to see profits, turned this new toy into an addiction, an addiction that kids can't get enough of. That is, except Barney who gets a defective toy he names Ron. Ron was dropped off a truck and therefore doesn't work quite right. He gets names wrong, he can't always connect to the internet. He doesn't always process information that great. 
He doesn't really know how a friend acts, so he just kind of goes off of whatever Barney says and takes it sometimes literally, sometimes abstractly to a fantastic degree. At first, the kids don't like Ron, but they start to appreciate him because he does stuff the other toys don't. Like, break his safety features so he can, oh, I don't know, beat up kids, buy alcohol, and sometimes kidnap people? Yeah, like I said, this movie really does earn its PG rating. As you'd imagine, though, through Ron's malfunction, he starts to show how everything else is technically malfunctioning, as it's the flaws and differences that have people interacting off each other and forming strong friendships, and not algorithms that say whether or not you're more likely to get along, causing kids to shut others out or mainly be alone forcing them into a depression about getting more digital friends than physical, actual friends. Okay, so if you've been watching me for a while, you know I'm not a big fan of social media, particularly Twitter. I know that's a thing now, everybody makes fun of Twitter, but even when it was invented, I said it was a bad idea. I was even joking about it on Nostalgia Critic episodes. Still trying to take over the world with that little Twitter invention of yours? Hey. Tell me it's not making people dumber. <laughs> Tell me it's not making them easier to conquer. So clearly, I'm gonna like the message this film has. But what's so clever is it isn't just showing it's all bad, because Ron is made by the same people. And he accomplishes what the original inventor wanted, it's just his vision got lost along the way. So without giving away too much, the ending isn't just get rid of all these toys, that's not the answer. There's a compromise that's really pretty damn brilliant. Even if it does take an extra third act to get there. Yeah, okay, let me get to the one problem with this movie, and yeah, I won't lie, it is kind of a big problem. The film looks like it's going to wrap up. It had a third act, it had a climax, it looks like everything should be winding down, but nope, there's suddenly this extra climax where they need to break into the place where they're made, and I guess I won't give it away, but it involves a lot of sneaking and corny slapstick, and it could have been integrated into the story a lot better. But like I said, the conclusion it comes to is very smart and very heartfelt. This is another one of those endings where a sacrifice is made, and it's actually a sacrifice. Something important is lost for the greater good. But even taking the message out of it, the comedy is hilarious. The dialogue is just as good as anything in the best Pixar flick. The toys are also really creative. I'm thinking to myself, man, if I was a kid, I would love one of these things. I love all the various things they can do and different designs. And yeah, did we mention yet that Disney bought Fox? There's a lot of tie-ins there. That's kind of annoying. But to its credit, it's not Free Guy bad. The acting, also fantastic. That's Jack Dylan Grazer as Barney, who after Shazam and Luca is another incredible young talent you should keep an eye out for. And Zach Galifianakis as Ron, I kept waiting for him to kind of slip back into his stage character. You know, cynical and snarky, acting like he knows everything, but then comedically it's shown that he doesn't. But we never get that. He is 100% convincing as this computer that's growing and trying to understand. And the way his personality grows is totally believable and likable. There's this running joke about saying the name Alcazar. They must do it like a dozen times in this movie, but every single time they do it, I bust a gut. I laugh so hard. It honestly wasn't until I started doing research that I realized what this movie reminded me of because it was the same director. This is one of the same directors of Arthur Christmas. One of the best Christmas movies ever made. The animated equivalent of Hot Fuzz, there's so many jokes in it. She literally hasn't directed another film in 10 years and by God, this is a great return. And yes, there are other directors who worked on this and they deserve credit too, but I'm sorry, so much of Arthur Christmas is in this movie and I mean that in the highest respect. This is also apparently the first film from a new animation company and by God, I hope there's more. I could not believe not only how much I was consistently laughing with this movie, but how emotionally invested I was in this story that I've seen a million times, but it really feels like a new and exciting spin has been brought to it. So yeah, if you had the same reaction I did to seeing the trailer, oh, that looks cute, but I'll probably skip it, see it, man. I can't guarantee you'll have the exact same reaction I did, but this isn't just another forgettable kids movie. This is really well done. It's funny, dramatic, looks great, has a wonderful message, memorable characters. If they just found a way to tighten up that other third act they suddenly slap on, I'd say it's damn near perfect. Give it a watch and see why this is a glitch you won't want to fix.
let's take a look at one of the earliest Capcom NES Disney games, DuckTales. This is another one I don't think I've played since, well, every kid had a Nintendo. I remember it being pretty fun when I was a kid, and yeah, it's still pretty fun now. Even if it was surprisingly short, I played this and Lion King on the same stream, and I actually had to find another game to play because I was over so early. Of course, part of that could be I was cheating and exploiting the rewind button, but nah, I'm just that good. The story, because Lord knows those were so important in the NES days, is Scrooge McDuck is trying to beat his rival Glomgold to be the richest duck in the world. So he travels in between five different locations to find five different treasures before Glomgold does, even though you never do see him chase after the treasures himself until the end. The controls are very simple and cleverly utilized from the show. In a lot of NES games, you just jump on top of the enemy and that would knock him out, like Mario Brothers. But here, not only do you use Scrooge's cane to jump higher, but that's also what you use to take him out, as well as knock objects out of the way. They didn't have to do that, have the fighting function tie into Scrooge's cane, but they did that. Good on you. The levels all have similar but different enough layouts with similar but different enough enemies. It probably goes without saying, but the music in this game is surprisingly really good. For whatever reason, there was a lot of epic themes that was written on 8-bit Super Mario Bros. Legend of Zelda. And as everybody has pointed out, the moon theme from this game goddamn rocks. God, such a good song. Ducks on the moon. But I was actually shocked to find how much I like some of the other music, like in Transylvania or the Amazon. While not as epic as the moon one, they are still really hummable, and yeah, they did stay in my mind even after I was done playing it. There is a good sense of a scavenger hunt in this. Like, I really like how you can go to one place and maybe a treasure is missing or a key is missing, so you may have to go to another place in order to find it. And when I say another place, I mean Transylvania. I don't know why. You have to go back to Transylvania like three times in this game. Maybe they just really like the level. I don't know. So yes, maybe a little bit more variety of places you have to go in order to get something else in another level. But the fact that they put this in the game at all, I thought was pretty neat. Any problems I have really are nitpicks. Like, I'm not really sure why Huey, Dewey, and Louie are just red and green. You use blue on the computer. I know you didn't run out of that color. There's another funny bit where you rescue one of them from the Beagle Boys, but he just stays there. <laughs> like he got Stockholm Syndrome and never wants to leave? I don't know, I'm not sure how this works. But yeah, that's just stupid shit comedians like me like to point out. The average gamer is not gonna care. I also like they utilize a lot of characters from the show, and even the ones that aren't from the show, you feel like could be. I remember playing this as a kid thinking, was there a duck statue at one point? Was there a duckula outside of, you know, duckula? I really like when a game doesn't have all the information on a show, they'll get the gist just well enough that they'll kind of make new ones, and it seems to fit. To the point where I couldn't remember if it was in the show or not. You want to live back to Duckburg, Mr. McD? You're just on the moon? <laughs> I think the one major complaint I have is that the final boss, if you can even call him that, really is far too easy. It's not even really a final boss, it's a race, and it is ridiculously simple to finish. For a game that's so much fun, it does have a fair amount of good bosses. This really was kind of a letdown. You really don't feel like you earn it. And yes, I know it's technically in the show, but come on, you can still go for something bigger. But I don't know, I still had a pretty good time. How can you not love DuckTales on the NES? The controls are good, it's fun, it has great music, it has the look and feel of the show. It's just an all-around good time. Yeah, I guess I can't say a ton more about it. It's just good. It's a good game. If you want life to be like an 8-bit hurricane again, then go ahead and grab onto some, well, you know. It's Tangled, the series, or is it Rapunzel's Tangled Adventure, or is it Tangled Before Ever After? Apparently this has quite a few names, but if you were to say it's Tangled the TV series, people would know what you're talking about. I think I heard about this series before, and I remember my thoughts just being, oh, that looks cute. I mean, I liked the movie fine, but I didn't love it or anything. So I just expected this to be a cute little show for kids, but everybody was telling me, no, 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 this is like a grand epic adventure and it has these amazing songs and the animation gets really good and the characters are great. 
Alright, fair enough. So after a ton of requests, I finally sat down, watched the whole thing, and they're absolutely right. Eventually. Yeah, this is another one of those shows that really starts off slow and boring and kind of on a different foot than what it ends on. The first season of the show is very, 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 very different from what the other two seasons are. As such, I was watching it thinking, what the hell is everybody talking about? But when it gets to the good stuff, it is really good. The pilot episode, which is the length of a TV movie, I think that's how it premiered as too, shows Rapunzel and Flynn Rider right after they escape Mother Gothel, trying to live out their happily ever after in this giant palace with her mother and father, but things start going wrong when suddenly these sharp black rocks appear. Rapunzel's badass in waiting, Cassandra, takes her out to the rocks to see what's going on when suddenly her long golden hair reappears. And, not coincidentally, the sharp black rocks start growing at an even faster rate. So Rapunzel, Flynn, Cassandra, and a whole slew of colorful characters venture out to find out what's causing this mayhem in Season 2. Season 1, her father says, no, no, it's too dangerous, and they just stay in the friggin' kingdom. And it drags. Every other episode, they're revealing, like, a new mystery to what these rocks are and an ancient evil that's behind it and what could be causing it, but all the other episodes, it's little social oddities, like, oh, what does Rapunzel do when somebody doesn't like her? Does Cassandra have to be a lady-in-waiting when she really wants to go and fight in tournaments? You know, being queen for a day is really hard, I but mean, who gives a shit? There's this grand magical land that hasn't been explored, and it's just ignoring it. And not only is the reason they're not exploring it so dumb just because the king says you can't, well, sneak out or something. Come on, haven't you ever seen a Disney anything? But the more and more you discover what's going on and the king's connection to it, the dumber and dumber he looks. This is an awful, stupid character. With that said, the first season seems to have a lean more towards younger kids. I get the feeling the creators wanted to go on that magical adventure, but maybe Disney was still trying to figure out their fan base, so they kind of kept it around the kingdom and sometimes they would venture out a little bit. So yeah, like I said, every other episode will be exploring what the mystery is, and the other ones tackle more what, say, a funny, clever manners class might teach. It is done well. Even that episode I was talking about where somebody doesn't like Rapunzel, it's done in a really funny way. Richard Kind voices the guy that doesn't like her, and he likes everybody, and everybody likes him. He just doesn't like her, and at the end, he still doesn't like her, and yeah, that's actually kind of a cool lesson, a good lesson to teach. Sometimes you just gotta cope. But yes, you are waiting for it to get to the point, and in season two, they finally do, and man, does it pick up. The show finally lets them explore, and there's a lot of cool places they discover, and they're design great, and they're creative, and you find out a lot about the characters as they go on these adventures. It sucks because I can't just say skip season one, because there are some important elements and characters and setups that are explored more in season two. So if you're like me, and you started, and you're scratching your head saying, why is everybody saying this is a great show, stick with it, it does get there. But yeah, when it gets going in Season 2, it's really great. The songs, though not as frequent as I thought, they pop up maybe every fourth episode, are pretty much Broadway-style songs. They're sung great, they're orchestrated great, they're written great. They explore what the characters are going through, they sing about their passions. They're really, really solid. The characters, both the original and the new ones they introduce, are all really interesting too, and most of them are given really good arcs. There are some choices characters make in this show that legitimately caught me off guard. There are some surprises at the end of Season 2 and the beginning of Season 3 I was gasping at. Holy shit, things just got so much more interesting in a story that was already interesting. The voice acting is also wonderful. Everyone has their comedic timing down, but the dramatic moments are really effective too. And some of the celebrity guests are really brilliantly utilized. I'm not going to say who voices this brain-dead monkey or Flynn Rider's father, but all I can say is you couldn't pick anyone better. The animation didn't grab me at first, I just don't really get into the style like kind of taking those golden storybooks and using flash animation to move them around. They just kind of look like flat construction paper. But as it goes on, it gets better and better and there's so much layer and dimension to them. If I did have one major problem after Season 1 is that the series finale kind of wraps up exactly how you would think it would wrap up. For a show that was so good at surprising you, and the characters legitimately caught on to stuff you would think they wouldn't catch on to, but they figure it out the same time you do, the ending is very by the numbers. But it's not really a letdown either. 
I guess there are a lot of finales that take big risks and they don't always pay off, but this one definitely plays it safe and I would have liked one or two more risks taken. With all that said, I do think this is a really good series. I'm so glad I stuck around and watched the whole thing. Even that first season I talked about isn't terrible, it's just not thinking that much of the adult audience or the ones that want to see like an epic story. I feel like they were bound to that kingdom because somebody said they had to stay there, whether it's Disney or one of the producers or whoever. But once season two gets going, it really gets going. So yes, everybody's right, it is a really good show with fantastic songs and wonderful characters and good animation, you just gotta be patient. But when it picks up, it picks up really quick. Tie up your hair and jump on in to see what everyone's been talking about. Goddamn right, I'm ending Disney Summer with a movie you've never heard of. It's unlikely you've ever heard of the film Midnight Madness, and I can guarantee you, you are never going to see it on Disney+. Plus. This is one of the most inappropriate Disney films ever made, and I kind of love the hell out of it for that. This was made when everybody was trying to do a ripoff of Animal House, and Disney was so in a slum and didn't know how to get out of it that they even tried their version of it. This is the only Disney film with the Paps Blue Ribbon theme song. It's the only Disney film where someone just jumps into a giant vat of beer. It's the only Disney film where one of the clues to find something is looking between the giant melons. And yes, it's exactly what you think it is. This movie makes fun of everything. Ugly people, fat people, old people, religions. It has no conscience, is phenomenally stupid, but I'll be damned if I didn't laugh my ass off at this. This has the makings of a cult classic, if it doesn't already have a cult following already. It opens at a university where seemingly this random group of college boys and college girls are given these flyers to show up this one night. But it turns out this was all planned by Leon. Leon! Who's Leon? Leon is essentially Bill. Everybody is just supposed to know who he is and know he's in his own world that we're supposed to understand, but we really don't, but we kind of do. He just kind of exists, and girls love him, and he seems to have an endless amount of money, but the landlord is trying to throw him out, but then she doesn't because everybody's getting into his schemes, and this is just the kind of movie it is. It exists in its own reality. Anyway, he tells this group of people that there's a scavenger hunt he's inviting them to participate in. What's the prize? Absolutely nothing. He just set this up thinking these people were all gonna go for it. At first they don't, but eventually the more they think about it, they decide to do it. Why? They all have stupid ridiculous reasons that don't make sense. But I'll be damned if they don't try as hard as if there was a million dollars at the end of this. All the stereotypes are there, the nerds, the jocks, the fat people, the feminists, the romantic couple that don't think they're gonna fall in love, but oh just wait till the end. They even come across some random celebrities before they were celebrities, like this is Michael J. Fox's first movie, and is that Pee Wee Herman? Yes, he's in this too. At first I was really turned off at the fact that there was no prize at the end and everybody seemed to be going crazy just to do this because they can, but the more I watched it and the more I realized how this bizarre sense of humor worked, the more I kind of loved it. It's not quite doing what the usual 80s dirty college comedy does. You can tell there were no, it's like, hey, hit this cliche or this kind of joke or whatever. But everyone's just kind of doing their own thing and doing it to the maximum degree. If someone's gonna be dumb in this, they're gonna be really dumb. If someone's gonna be geeky in this, they're gonna be phenomenally geeky. It has that guy who voiced Mandark from Dexter's Laboratory. I'm in kind of a rush, so I'll just put his name here. There he is. And he just steals the show. Every time he's on screen, he is always doing that voice and doing it as loud and geeky as possible. And then there is the question as to whether football players belong in an academic institution in the first place. And if there are any comments from the audience, just feel free to toss them right up here. To give you an idea how the humor works, here's an example. Remember that scene I was talking about how I said there's a clue in between the giant melons and it takes them a while to figure it out? Well, once they do, they all start throwing stuff off the table like, oh, waitress, something slipped so they can get a closer look at the clue. Each one keeps throwing more and more until it results in... <laughs> it's just that kind of nonsense. 
I love when you can tell they're just supposed to shoehorn in these scenes that these kind of movies just have. Like, the quote-unquote romantic couple figure out the clue from the giant melons, and when they do, they just suddenly look like they're in love. I can't believe it! We got all of that from Hug Me! <laughs> Where did that come from? One of the boys has a computer that he just types in the clue and the computer just figures it out. He doesn't have to give it any context at all. I love this one bit where they're given like these pictures and these letters and one kid seems to figure it out but he leaves out the ball. What does the ball have to do with it? What about the ball? <laughs> you idiot! And like I said, this movie is 100% 80s inappropriate. I love this one scene where like this geeky boy is gonna date this girl and uh-oh, she's ugly. Yeah, you're coming with us. But what about my date? Believe me, Flinch. You'll thank us in the morning. Yeah. The more I watch it and question why everybody is doing everything, the funnier it gets because I don't even think they question it. They just go 100% into it and give it their all. Nobody cares if it makes sense, they just want you to laugh and they do everything in the silliest, most over-the-top way. And by God, if you just give yourself to it, it's one of the funniest things you'll ever see. Every time I bring this film up to someone, they have no idea what it is or that it's even a Disney flick, but man, more and more people gotta see it. I think all there is is a DVD copy, I don't even think there's a Blu-ray copy, and I don't know if there ever will be. Again, I can see Disney really trying to keep this quiet and act like, no, 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 we didn't make that. Granted, even if this wasn't a Disney movie, I would find it so hilarious. Like I said, everyone's just so into it and it's so crazy. But knowing that it is, is just the icing on the cake. More people need to find out about this movie. They need to know that it was made by Disney, it exists, and it is one of the stupidest but most enjoyable comedies ever made. There really is a passion and a talent to the timing, to the delivery, to the visual jokes. Yes, it is dumb, but it is passionately dumb. If you want to see a comedy, Disney or not, where you just watch it and say, oh my god, I can't believe this exists, Midnight Madness is the one to check out, man. Not enough people know about it, it needs a cult following, more folks need to be quoting the lines. Jesus Christ, let's get more people looking at this. And folks, that's about it. That's Disney December 2021. Like always, I thank you so much for tuning in. I guess I've been doing this for 10 years, people have been bringing up. I didn't even think about it, but yeah, that's crazy to think. I really do have all of you to thank for that. I love doing these. I love sitting down and playing these games, watching these shows, experiencing these movies, revisiting classics, checking out new things that are both good and bad. I'm always going to be fascinated by Disney because whether or not they're doing great things or not so great things, it's always interesting. And you all seem to find it interesting too, so I thank you all so much again for sticking around, watching these, and sharing the fun with me. I hope you had a good time, and as always, I'll see you next year.